Okay. We're live. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Boston School Committee. I'm Chairperson Jerry Robinson. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Because this is a remote meeting, I will ask Ms. Sullivan to please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Present. Mr. De Arujo? Present. Ms. Lopera? Present. Ms. Lau? Present. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Present. Mr. Tran? Present. Mr. O'Neill? Here. Ms. Robinson? Present. All members are present. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Tonight's session is being shared live on Zoom. It will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the school committee's webpage and on YouTube. Tonight's meeting documents are posted on the committee's webpage at bostonpublicschools.org backslash school committee under the November 3rd meeting link. The agenda, presentations and equity impact statements have been translated in all of the major BPS languages. Any translations that are not ready prior to the start of the meeting will be posted as soon as they are finalized. The committee is pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Arabic, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verdiano, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and American Sign Language. After the interpreters introduce themselves and provide Zoom instructions, we will activate the interpretation icon, the globe at the bottom of your screen. Click the icon to select your language preference. Will our Spanish interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Espanol. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Distinguished guests, my name is Juan Bernal. I am the Spanish interpreter who will be interpreting consecutively and exclusively for a school committee member, <clears throat> Spanish speaking, Ms. Rafaela Polanco Garcia, while the other two interpreters, Mr. Randolph and Ms. Luz, will be providing interpretation simultaneously for those in need. I will proceed to make the same announcement in Spanish. Muy buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. Soy parte de lo, del equipo de intérpretes asignados esta noche. Voy a interpretar exclusivamente para la miembra del Comité Escolar Hispanoparlante, la señora Rafaela Polanco García, mientras los otros dos intérpretes van a proveer el servicio de interpretación de una forma simultánea. Para accesar el servicio de la interpretación, busquen el globo que aparece en la parte baja derecha de sus pantallas, Hagan un clic y seleccionen el idioma español como su idioma de preferencia. De igual manera, aquellas personas que se estén conectando de un teléfono celular, de una tableta <coughs> o de un iPad, busquen los tres puntos que aparecen en la parte superior de la pantalla, seleccionen Language Interpretation, Interpretación y Español como su idioma de preferencia. Muchas gracias por su presencia. Thank you very much. The next interpreter may proceed. Thank you. Hello, muy buenas noches, damas y caballeros. Mi nombre es Randolph Domínguez. Voy a ser su intérprete simultáneo. Good evening, Madam Chair. And good evening to all members of the school committee. My name is Randolph Domínguez, and I'm going to be one of the simultaneous interpreters for tonight. Good evening. My name is Luz Barreto. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Luz Barreto. Y seré su intérprete simultánea con el señor Randolph. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Will our Arabic interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Arabic? Good evening. This is Alat. I, I will be the Arabic interpreter. I will be interpreting simultaneously. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there a second Arabic interpreter? No? Okay, I'll move yes. on. Oh, there is? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Hi, my name is Karima Mella. I am the interpreter. I'm going to interpret him tonight. And it's me, Karima Mella. I'm going to be with you tonight, inshallah. Thank you. 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 Will our Haitian Creole interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Haitian Creole? Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergio Santiller, Haitian Creole interpreter. Euh, nous sommes très contents pour nous avoir après midi moi même avec Nadej, nous avons assuré l'interprétation et que nous sommes très contents pour nous dire tout ça que nous avons pour dire, pas hésiter pour dire, pour demander à faire un club en bas, quand nous avons cliqué et pour nous avons entré dans la conversation. Nous avons commencé et, et puis Nadej a pris à 7h30 et puis après, nous avons tourné encore à 10h. And merci beaucoup. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nadej. Uh, I'll be your Haitian Creole interpreter. Bonsoir tout le monde. Nom c'est Nadej. Comme c'est le fait que nous, nous sommes prêts à l'interpréter pour nous assurer. C'est un réel plaisir pour nous là. Et m'a commencé à 7h30. Nous avons fini à 10h. Et pas oublier, choisir un channel français. Hein? Et puis tout, si vous avez une question, tapez notre chat là. Merci. Thank you. Will our Cabo Verdiano interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Cabo Verdiano? Good evening, good everyone. Uh, my name is Jose, and then my partner uh, tonight is Armando. We're going to be the Cabo Verdiano interpreter for this meeting tonight. Boa noite. Meu nome é José. Cunha companheiro Armando hoje noite no Santa Bem a nesta reunião de comitê a fim de ajudar a nossa comunidade na parte de interpretação. Tem um parte na janela, não onde nós podemos clicar lá, que é um globo, quem está na, na laptop ou no computador, nós temos lá que nós podemos clicar, a hora que nós achamos que é o globo, daí nós selecionamos a parte de língua calvardiana. E alguns de nós que têm uh, móvel, nós podemos clicar, tem um três pontinhos lá, onde nós temos carta também, e teremos um ícone, onde nós achamos que é a parte para nós selecionar a nossa língua. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Armando Monteiro. I'm going to be your keyboard interpreter for tonight. Boa noite. Meu nome é Armando Monteiro. A minha sabem ser o intérprete de crioulo cabo verdiano hoje. E é muito prazer estar aqui conosco. Boa noite. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Will our Cantonese interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Cantonese? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna. Terry and I will be providing simultaneous Cantonese interpretation tonight. Thank you so much. Terry, your turn. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Will our Mandarin interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Mandarin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Maple. I will be working with Tina tonight as your Mandarin simultaneous interpreters. Mandarin。Tina。Oh, thank you. This is uh, Tina Maple's partner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Will our Vietnamese interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Vietnamese? Good evening, my name is Yuyen, Vietnamese interpreter. Xin chào quý vị. À, nếu mà anh chị có cần thông dịch liên tục thì xin bấm vào quả cầu và chọn ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt. À, chúng tôi sẽ cung cấp thông dịch liên tục cho các anh chị. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is V. I will be your Vietnamese interpreter for tonight's meeting. Um, kính chào quý vị, uh, tôi tên là Vi. Tôi sẽ đồng hành cùng chị Duyên là người thông dịch cho quý vị vào buổi tối ngày hôm nay. Cảm ơn nhiều. Thank you. Thank you. Will our American line, American Sign Language Interpretation interpreters please introduce yourselves? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kylie. I will be the only interpreter tonight for American Sign Language. If you need access to interpreting, please push pin on your screen and I will appear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for assisting us this evening. Thank you to all of the BPS staff behind the scenes who also provide support for our virtual meetings to run smoothly. We will now activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Thank you to everyone who signed up for public comment. Sign okay. up for both public comment periods closed today at 4.30 p.m. Please make sure that you are signed into Zoom under the same name you use to sign up for public comment. You can use the Zoom tools to rename yourself so that committee staff will be able to recognize you when it comes time to call on you. Thank you all for your cooperation. As we begin here tonight, I wanna to take a moment to congratulate Marilek Wu on her victory last night. I know that the news coverage has mentioned the many firsts that she now occupies, but I worry a bit that saying it so often starts to take away from the truly historic victory we saw last night. So instead of reviewing this amazing accomplishment, again, I just simply wanna offer my deepest congratulations to Marilek Wu. We look forward to working with you uh, Mayor Elect Wu and her team to continue efforts to improve the Boston Public Schools for all of our students and our families. I also want to congratulate Councilor Asabi George and her team for their campaign and all of the hours they spent meeting voters across the city. I appreciate everyone who volunteered, whether on a campaign or to staff the polling places yesterday. It's always heartening to see democracy in action and especially heartening to know both finalists were not only highly experienced city councils, but both, are B, but both also are BPS parents and know firsthand both the opportunities and the challenges our families face every day. Finally, I wanna commend Mayor Janie for her leadership and her partnership, especially as we were getting students and staff back in the building for full-time in-person learning this year. Mayor Janie, a highly knowledgeable education advocate as well, has worked closely with this committee for years and is held in the highest regard for her dedication to the city and our school district. And we look forward to her continued involvement in whatever her next steps becomes. I also wanna recognize the passage of question three last night, a non-binding referendum regarding the makeup of the Boston School Committee. As chair, I have been asked a lot of questions about the ballot initiative. And I note that as appointed officials, our job is to administer the roles and responsibilities of the committee as outlined in the state law establishing and governing this committee. It is a role, role that we collectively take most seriously as dedicated public servants and will continue to do so until such time as the city council, mayor and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts acting in concert decide on a different model. In the meantime, my colleagues and I will continue with our important work, listening to the community and partnering with the superintendent. Most importantly, we remain intensely focused on improving the educational outcome for all 52,000 youth in our collective care. Tonight, I want to welcome our alternative student representative, Tiffany Lau for tonight's meeting. She'll be filling in for Zaire Mercer. Tiffany, we're glad you can join us tonight. Thank you, Chair. Glad to Thank join you. us. Thank you. Right. Has the mayor joined us? Has Mayor Janie joined us? Yes, I'm, I'm here. All right, thank you. We're thrilled to have Mayor Kim Janie with us this evening. Kim Janie made history as the first black mayor and black woman to hold the office. In her former role, at Massachusetts Advocates for Children, also known as MAC, Mayor Janney was a regular fixture at school committee meetings, 
paying particular focus on closing gaps for students of color, English learners, and students living in poverty. As mayor, she has continued that commitment. Thank you, Mayor Janey, for your partnership during this critical time in our city. And thank you to your talented and dedicated staff for their support over the last several months. We know that you will continue your long career in public service and continue to do great things for our city. And we are delighted to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Robinson, committee members, Superintendent Dr. Caselius. Greetings. My name is Kim Janey, and I have the honor of serving as mayor of Boston. As many of you may know, I come from a long line of educators. So I have long understood the importance of education as a parent of a BPS graduate and as a longtime education advocate, I have worked hard to ensure that all of our young people have a quality education that meets their needs. Um, as mayor of Boston, I am proud of the work that we've been able to do over a short period of time to get our children back in school. Uh, it is important to note that this is the third school year uh, that is being impacted by COVID-19. And I really wanted to express my deep, deep gratitude uh, to the superintendent, to the Boston School Committee, to our teachers, to our bus drivers, to our, our lunch monitors, to all of our school staff and those who work in central office for amazing work and getting our schools reopened and our students back in the classroom for in-person learning. Uh, it is so critically important. Uh, we also opened up uh, with a record first day attendance uh, this school year, uh, and we have beat our five-year average in terms of on-time bus arrival uh, this school year. We have an opportunity to make historic investments with F ESSER funding uh, to make sure that we continue to do the work beyond COVID-19. Um, we also did important work in terms of revamping our exam school admissions, an issue that I had worked on long before elected office, something that I worked on while I was at MAC with a number of uh, organizations. And it was really good to see uh, the superintendent and the Boston School Committee adopt a new policy uh, that gives more opportunity to more students. Uh, we also have the opportunity to do more in terms of uh, swim uh, for our young people and families all across the city of Boston. A couple of weeks ago, I launched a new initiative and we are st still exploring options in terms of our third grade curriculum for swimming. Uh, we've done a lot in a short period of time, but there is so much more work to do. As each of you know, I've been a broken record on the need to focus on our opportunity gaps so that our young people have exactly what they need to succeed. And I know that each of you share that commitment. Um, and there's so much more work to do, whether we're talking about expanding dual language, whether we're talking about teacher diversity, uh, or the need uh, to ensure that we're focused on our vote tech school like Madison Park, uh, to make sure that we're doing more in terms of literacy, and expanding opportunity for early childhood education, the investments we need to make into our school buildings and so much more. And as I leave office, I am encouraged that the next mayor uh, is coming in, that she is a woman, a woman of color, that she is a BPS mom who understands the importance of all of these issues. I've worked with her, uh, particularly around Madison Park and some of the other uh, education issues that are important. And I know that she will lead our city uh, to a good place, particularly as it relates to our schools as a BPS mom. And so I am uh, really grateful that my granddaughter who is seven years old can look up and still see uh, a woman leading the city of Boston. And so I want to extend my congratulations uh, to her publicly. I certainly wanna thank the entire uh, Boston City Council for their strong advocacy as it relates uh, to our school. Certainly want to acknowledge Councilor Asabi George, who has led the uh, Education Committee on the Boston City Council for all of her work. Uh, but at this time, 
I want to extend uh, my partnership to the superintendent, to the school committee, and certainly to Mayor-elect Wu. Uh, she uh, prepares to take uh, office in the next couple of weeks. And I also wanna give just a heartfelt thank you to, again, the teachers and parents and so many others who have been working on the front lines to reopen our schools and to make sure that our children have everything that they need. Um, we've got more work to do, but I'm encouraged because I know we will continue to do that work together. So thank you so much for the opportunity and love to turn it over to Mayor Elect Wu. Thank you very much, Mayor Janey. Uh, Madam Chair, is it okay if I jump right in? Okay. Yes, I will. please do. Sorry. I'm okay. Continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you. I'm I'm so delighted and honored to just say a few words here, mostly to echo the gratitude and and deep thanks and recognition for all that our BPS school communities have gone through over many years now with the tumultuousness of the COVID nineteen pandemic and the many issues that have fed into that the gaps that have widened, the stresses on our families, the mental health stresses now uh, of stretching across our communities. I want to thank Mayor Janey for her consistent leadership and advocacy for the young people of our city, starting from long before she was in this role or even on the council or in elected office. This was her focus and this was her, this was her top priority um, and her leadership has since continued to back that up. As she mentioned, uh, this is an area that I'm going to take very personally because my two boys are at the Sumner School. We have gone through now Zoom kindergarten. Now we're in first grade and K1. And it's my second go round, having raised my younger sister as her legal guardian through BPS as well. And so on the campaign trail, we put out a uh, very robust set of plans and ideas and vision around the Boston Public Schools that came directly from visits and conversations and listening sessions with our educators and young people and school leaders and community members. And so I'm, I'm very, very excited to have the chance to dig in here and to continue building on the progress and the leadership of this administration. I wanna thank the superintendent for her uh, warm welcome and eagerness to uh, help me hit the ground running with the many issues that will be ongoing and many of which Mayor Janie and I discussed earlier today at her office in City Hall and for the school committee members too, for your service. Um, looking forward to continuing to get to know you and working to take on the big challenges within our city and our district, but also make sure we are delivering day to day as, as a parent, a BPS mom, I know it is the, the little details that make it possible for us to get to the big things. So I'm very grateful, humbled, we'll be back of course, but just wanted to say thank you to Mayor Janie and thank you to everyone in BPS. Thank you for the taking the time to join us tonight, Mayor Elect Wu, and congratulations again. The committee looks forward to partnering with you as we work together to move forward our district. Thank you. Finally, I want to thank Mayor Janey for appointing Ms. LaPera and Ms. Polanco Garcia to the school committee. They have brought such a valuable perspective to the committee as parents and thought partners and really pushing our thinking. Their terms are co-terminus co with the acting mayor, so we don't know at this moment what the future will hold. There is a public process that the school committee nominating panel is working through right now. Personally, I've learned a, lo a lot from both of our newest members, and I want to thank Ms. LaPera and Ms. Polanco Garcia for their commitments to our students and our families. Thank you so much. We'll now move on to the approval of minutes. At this time, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the October 27th, 2021 school committee meeting as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Rougeau? Uh, abstain. Ms. Lopera? 
Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The minutes are approved unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We'll now move on to the superintendent's report. I present to you our superintendent, Dr. Brenda Casalius. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for joining us tonight. It's only been a week since our last meeting, so I have a very brief but informative report. Last night marked yet another historic day in the city of Boston. I want to congratulate Michelle Wu, who was elected as our next mayor of Boston of this great city. She's not only the first woman elected as mayor, but also the first person of color and the first candidate of Asian American descent to be elected mayor in Boston. Boston is a wonderfully diverse and vibrant city, which we see represented in our schools each and every day. I have witnessed firsthand the importance of diverse representation for our students. It is incredibly valuable for our children to see themselves in their leadership as they imagine their professional and personal dreams and goals. Thank you, Marilek Wu, for joining us this evening and for those inspiring words. I look forward to working with you in our continued quest to provide a world-class education for all of our students and look forward to your progressive, bold vision for our schools. I also wanna thank Mayor Janie for joining us this evening and for her incredible leadership of our city over the last seven months. It has been a pleasure working with you and I look forward to your ongoing partnership as you transition to your new role in civic leadership. I know you will continue to be involved in BPS because you love our children and you put their, them and their families first. Thank you for the support of BPS students and their families during these unprecedented and challenging times in which you've been steady in your leadership and your support of Boston Public Schools. We couldn't have done it without you and the entire cabinet. So much thanks to you and the cabinet for supporting Boston Public Schools during this pandemic and just always uh, supporting us. I'm gonna switch over to some uh, updates on school registration. School choice season for 2022-23 is here. We encourage all families that are in the final grade of their current schools or who plan to register for BPS to research their school options in preparation for registration, which opens in January. At this time, all BPS schools are holding school preview times or virtual information sessions for prospective families to learn more about each school. Meet the school leaders and ask any questions that they have. For a list of school preview dates, times, as well as info sessions at each school, you can visit bostonpublicschools.org forward slash school preview. There you will also find an interest form in 10 languages to fill out. We also encourage you to visit discover BPS at discover.bostonpublicschools.org. Discover BPS is a search engine that helps parents understand which schools their child, child or children are eligible to attend and is also an overall great resource for additional information about all BPS schools. In addition, all four BPS welcome centers in Georgechester, East Boston, Roslindale, and Roxbury will open for additional hours this Saturday, November 6th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. to support all families, but particularly current Irving Jackson Mann and Timothy families. We continue working with these individual school communities to provide specialized registration and support. For additional information and further updates throughout the school choice season, please visit bostonpublicschools.org forward slash registration. I'll now move on to one of my favorite and frequent sections of this report highlighting our amazing teachers and their dedication to the district. 
As I mentioned in my October 6th report, Marjorie Pida, pre-K teacher at the Rafael Hernandez K-8 school in Roxbury was the recipient of the prestigious Adelante Award, a national recognition that celebrates public school educators who have made significant contributions to advance educational equity, meaningfully engage Latino families, and work diligently to enhance the schooling experience of Latino students. Concurrently, Candido Munda Arboleda, Spanish language literacy teacher for the SLIFE program was also named an awardee by Latinos for Education. Both Marjorie and Candida were honored at the LFE State of Latino Education Conference that same week which coincided with Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month. I had the pleasure of surprising Marjorie and Candida last week at the Hernandez School with school committee member Lorena Lopera and Rashawn Martin, BPS Director of Retention Programs and Services for Educators of Color. We were able to chat about their best practices in the classroom and meet some of their students. I'm so BPS proud of our dynamic and dedicated educators who continue to exemplify our district's commitment to excellence, linguistic diversity, and equity for the benefit of our students and families. Gracias, Marjorie and Candida. It's been exciting to hear that the FDA, FDA and CDC have approved vaccines for some of our youngest learners age five to 11 this week. We're hosting an Ask a Doctor information session on November 15th at 6.30 p.m. We invite families to join us for this session to learn more about why vaccinations are important and ask any questions that they may have. We're also working with our partners at the Boston Public Health Commission to ensure that our students and families feel safe, that they're informed and they have easy access to the vaccines once they are available. And we'll be hosting several clinics in November and December specifically for our students age five plus. Those dates and locations will be finalized in the next few days and families can learn more at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash vaccines. We hosted nearly 45 clinics so far at our schools in partnership with Boston Medical Center and we are working to schedule additional clinics at our elementary schools. Again, all of this information is available at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash vaccines. Lastly, while getting vaccinated is a serious and important part in keeping the entire BPS and Boston community safe, we wanna make sure our students and families also have fun while doing it. With that, we're planning some family fun days in the new year that will also include vaccine distribution for those who are interested in receiving one. Please keep your eyes peeled for various district communications providing more details on information sessions and vaccine clinics and to promote upcoming events. I wanna quickly acknowledge feedback that we have received from the Sumner, the Mendel and the Blackstone schools following our Build PPS presentation last week. My team has done additional walkthroughs at each of these schools this week to ensure that we are making the best decisions for our communities and with our communities. We must take a number of things into consideration in addition to the physical space. We have to also consider the potential trade-offs that these school communities would be making. I know that this is difficult for all of those who are impacted. We're hosting community meetings for the Sumner, the Mendel and the Blackstone schools this week and next to further discuss these updates and to answer any of their questions. I will work with my team to keep you all updated. Additionally, I want to remind the community and those listening tonight that the school committee is not voting on the closures for the Jackson Mann, the Timothy and the Irving this evening. That vote will take place at the next meeting, which is scheduled for November 17th. I have an additional update in regards to school choice. For this year's school choice season, school lists will continue to be determined by the 2019 school quality framework tiers. 
We made this decision in light of changes to data collection during COVID and to be consistent with the Mass DESE accountability system. It was not possible to calculate the school quality framework based on 2020 or 2021 data, as the MCAS was not administered in the 1920 school year, and there were changes in the test and administration practices in the 2020-21 school year. In addition, the recent student teacher and parent climate surveys were abridged and focused on remote and hybrid learning in both years. And furthermore, any data that is available will reflect the inequitable impacts of the pandemic. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleague, Monica Roberts, for more than 16 years of service to the Boston Public Schools community. As previously announced, Monica is leaving her role as Chief of Family and Community Advancement at BPS to serve as the Executive Director of City Year Greater Boston. Monica has been an invaluable member of my team from the very first day I came to Boston Public Schools. Her unique brand of leadership over the past 12 years has resulted in countless improvements in the lives of Boston students and families, and she leaves a legacy that will live on long after her time with us. Monica has spearheaded so many critical initiatives for the district. She's a respected colleague, a dedicated community leader, and a proud BPS graduate. Monica reminds us all of the immense talent and incredible potential of every single one of our BPS students. I'm so proud of her and her and appreciative of her service. And I wish her only the best of luck. She will still be really close by. So we'll be calling on her uh, for quite a while. It's also with mixed emotions that I also announced that Xavier Andrews, our Director of Communications is leaving the district for a new adventure. Xavier has been with me since, since day one as a trusted advisor and confidant. He has led our efforts to share the good news of our students and staff with the media and with the broader community. Work that is often challenging, but always rewarding. He's also a graduate of BPS and the son of a dedicated nurse at Ellison School. I'm grateful for his leadership, his steady approach, and his unwavering commitment to our students. Xavier, you know I'm gonna miss you. And so, uh, both you and Monica, it is, um, it's gonna be hard for me. You both always have um, been here for me and um, you know that you always have a home to come back to here at BPS. And then just finally, to add to um, what Madam Chair, you shared about Ms. LaPera and Ms. Polenko Garcia's tenure here uh, on the school committee. I know it has been short um, and reappointment is um, in the works for um, all of the new school committee um, members and or four of them anyway. Um, and I just wanna thank them for their service um, on the school committee. It has been wonderful to have both of you on the school committee and in such a short time to have your presence and your commitment to our students and all that you've uh, been able to contribute um, these past several months. And I just uh, give my full gratitude to each of you uh, for your time on the school committee so far. And for that, that's my superintendent report this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Superintendent, for that report. I'll now open up to questions and discussions for the committee. I'd like to remind my colleagues about our agreed upon norm that we each have five minutes, that's one to two questions. And I'd like to remind BPS staff to also be brief with your responses. If you have additional questions, I'll come back and do a second round. If you have a question, please raise your hand virtually or put it in the chat. Does anyone have any questions? Any comments? Mr. De Arusha. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Superintendent, for your report. Um, just a, a, a few comments. Um, uh, first, on, on the vaccination piece, I, I really appreciate outlining uh, the plans and the goals on that. Uh, also grateful to the Boston Medical Center uh, for the collaboration. Uh, as we know, you know our students we are, are some of the populations that are hardest to reach. 
uh, for vaccinations and care. So it's great that we're doing um, direct education from trusted individuals, uh, doing, doing vaccination clinics on site, which I think is going to be really important uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we offer as many kind of access points and opportunities to children uh, to get these, you know, the, the, these life-saving um, uh, medicines into them uh, soon. So, so thank you very much uh, for the focus on that. We look forward to hearing um, more as that, that progresses. Um, also, I appreciate your announcing, um, you know, we've all been hearing on the, uh, the uh, concerns around the reconfigurations around schools and expanding um, sixth grade and number of schools so that uh, we're going to have this community process uh, before we actually uh, vote on, on, uh, on the closures. Um, I know I'll, I'll hope to attend a number of these community meetings. Uh, I've heard from uh, families and, uh, and educators uh, concerns about how their schools are going and it's, it's good to see that uh, we're directly engaging with everyone. So I appreciate uh, your announcing uh, that uh, as well. Um, and then finally, just really I'm all, I'm all comments tonight. Um, just I, I appreciate Madam Chair uh, acknowledging uh, the, uh, you know, the vote uh, on, on the elected school committee. Um, uh, I appreciate the way you framed it. Uh, one, one thing I would say is at least, at least the way I interpret it, uh, part of it for me is that, um, you know, uh, I believe in this model. Um, it's a model that is you know, created by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the democratically created model. Um, but what I really believe is that, you know, we, we need to show our stuff. Uh, we, we need to show people what we can do. Uh, and the past few years have been um, extraordinarily challenging for all the reasons we've discussed. Uh, but we really can, you know, seize the moment, new administrations at multiple, multiple levels, and, um, and really be a part of, uh, of building on, on what's working in our district, uh, but also, uh, you know, meeting those challenges that continue to be challenges. So, so uh, for me, I think it, uh, it, it, you know, definitely lit a fire uh, that uh, the public says, uh, you know, we, we need to focus and we really need to uh, address these longstanding issues. So uh, with that, uh, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Gracias. Uh, quiero, gracias, señora presidenta. Primeramente quiero darle las gracias porque um, antes de estar en el comité, yo tenía una visión, ¿verdad? Sobre el comité. He tenido la oportunidad de compartir desde mi posición hispanohablante con muchos miembros de ustedes que están aquí hoy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I had a different vision uh, before joining the uh, Boston School Committee as uh, so being a uh, speaking, Spanish speaking person and sharing uh, with all the uh, Boston School Committee members here today. Y he tenido la oportunidad de compartir con muchos de ustedes y, es, y, y siento que han, tienen un corazón hermoso. Eh, me han dado una bienvenida eh, siendo una es hispanohablante y me han dado una acogida dentro dentro del grupo dentro de sus corazones que yo aprecio muchísimo. I do have to say that I appreciate very much the welcoming. I've been sharing in many many moments with you. You welcome me here, considering that I am a Spanish speaking member as well. That was quite a reception, and from my heart, I do appreciate that you welcome me from your hearts. Um, la, el agradecer al panel de nominación y también a uh, eh, King Janey, la alcaldesa que tuvo la visión inclusiva de pensar en que eh, una hispanohablante estuviera en la mesa eh, del Comité de las Escuelas Públicas. I do have to appreciate the nomination panel as well, and particularly uh, Kim Janey, who had the vision as a mayor or have, of having a representation in a table of someone who speaks Spanish, a Spanish-speaking person. She had that vision. I appreciate that. Aprecio mucho que cuando hemos hecho comentario de la oficina de la superintendente, nos han llamado, inclusive hoy recibí una llamada del equipo de la superintendente, y aprecio muchísimo porque... Puedo ver que están escuchando las familias, que están escuchando los estudiantes, porque eh, eh, me contactan por si tengo alguna apreciación, si tengo algún comentario. Y yo creo que es importante, eso es importante que tomen en cuenta eso. So there is something that is very comforting to me. I've been actually getting calls. So when there is a comment that is directed to the office, that is the Boston Public Schools office, they do contact me. I do appreciate that because it shows that they are hearing to the people and they are communicating that. 
y, y eso habla muy bien de ella, de su equipo, de que, de que están escuchando a la familia. Y yo sé, siento que debemos restablecer la confianza de las familias, de los maestros, de los estudiantes en, en el distrito educativo, en el really? comité. It is very important to reestablish that confidence that exists as part of the uh, teachers and the education members as well. So I do have to appreciate that from the, the uh, superintendent. And that speaks volumes about her as well, the ability to hear the families. Jurídicamente, hoy es mi, último, mi última reunión pública con ustedes. So technically, I would have to say that uh, legally and technically, it is my last meeting as part of the uh, Boston School Committee with you guys. Sin embargo, mi full-time job es organizadora. Eh, mi full-time job, yo soy organizadora de, de padres. Eh, yo tengo una responsabilidad muy grande con mi comunidad y yo voy a continuar, voy, voy a continuar con ustedes aun cuando no esté dentro de la mesa del comité pero sí, ustedes van a estar escuchando siempre de Rafaela Polanco, porque yo siempre voy a estar haciendo mi trabajo como organizadora, trabajando por el bienestar de las escuelas, de los estudiantes y de los maestros. I will continue working, even though I'm not uh, sitting at the table with the school committee, you will hear from me, you will hear from Rafaela Polanco Garcia. It is my full-time job, that's what I do, I'm an organizer, I organize parents, so somehow you will continue hearing from me. Que agra muchas gracias a todos y eh, vamos a seguirnos viendo. Eh, acabo de eh, hoy enviar mi aplicación nuevamente para eh, ser evaluada y espero tener suerte. Pero de todas formas, yo voy a continuar con ustedes. Me van a seguir viendo, van a seguir mirándome y muy honrada, de verdad. Un honor enorme haber estado con ustedes eh, dentro del comité. It has been an honor being a part of this great committee. I am in the process actually of sending my application to be evaluated. Uh, they will take a look at that. But it's been an honor. It's been an honor being part of this great committee, being with you. Y finalmente, no puedo dejar de darle las gracias a Lena y a Elizabeth. Gracias por la paciencia, Lena y Elizabeth, porque sé que han, han tenido que estar haciendo mucho y te, haciendo las traducciones de los documentos. Agradezco mucho la ayuda, el soporte y, y también a eh, Lopera, Miss Lopera de, Ara, de Araujo y todos ustedes, eh, 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 Ocnio, que también tuve la oportunidad de hablar con él cuando nos vimos personalmente. Así que gracias a la presidenta, a, a Brenda Caselio, gracias a todos. Oh. Espero seguir viendo. Thank you very much to the entire uh, team. I will continue seeing you guys, particular thanks to Ms. Lina and Ms. Elizabeth, whom were present all the time with the translations of the documents to, to be linguistically present at all times. I do really appreciate your patience and your help provider. Thank you so much to Ms. Lopera. Thank you very much to Ms. Arud, Mr. Arujo, Madam President, Superintendent, everybody. I will continue being involved. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaPera. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And um, it's always hard to follow Rafaela because she just says it all incredibly beautifully and from the heart. Um, but I do just want to take a moment to uh, thank uh, Mayor Janey uh, for allowing me to serve in this capacity. Um, and really the superintendent for always making time to explain or answer my questions, um, my many questions, and uh, my fellow committee members for quickly bringing me into the fold. Um, I know that my time serving in this capacity as school committee member has been short, um, but I am honored for the opportunity. I want to also thank the district staff who again have answered many of my questions. Um, thank you to school-based staff who have opened their doors and classroom doors. Um, to, for me to be able to see the work on the ground. And really thank you to students and families who've reached out and entrusted me with their questions and concerns. Um, as Rafaela mentioned, um, I too am a BPS parent, um, Boston resident, and I wholeheartedly believe that um, the city and the state's future is right in our classrooms. And it's our responsibility to cultivate and educate our future leaders. So regardless of whether I'm in this seat or not um, with the new administration, I will be right there with uh, member uh, Polanco Garcia, um, know that I will continue to be a champion for equity and quality education. So thank you for allowing me to serve in this capacity. 
Um, as far as the superintendent's report, um, the only piece that I really have a question on, um, I agree with uh, many of the comments that member De Rougeau, uh brought up, um, especially around the continued engagement of communities, school communities that are being um, impacted directly by some of the proposed changes in, in grade configuration. Um, I think one of the pieces that I haven't heard too much more about, um, so we've heard about visiting schools that could potentially, um, that aren't slated right now to have additional sixth grade in their mix, uh, which I appreciate that uh, continued evaluation and community engagement. I think the part that I'm still uh, have questions around is the proposed uh, expansion of some of the seven to 12 um, schools. As I mentioned at our last meeting, I really wanna understand how um, the quality of the academics, um, academic opportunities that exist in those schools um, is a part of the, the thinking process around expansion in those schools. And so that's really my, my only question. The other pieces I know we're still working with community, um, but I wanna understand how some of the proposed seven to 12s um, can really be a viable pathway for students and families? Yeah, that's good questioning. Um, and we are working right now with the impacted schools and then we will outline the process for our remainder of our high schools and the remainder of our K-5s. As we shared in the presentation last week, we also know that this could impact our K-8s. And so we don't wanna be doing those three things piecemeal. We wanna come up with a full plan. Um, and so we'll be doing that engagement work with the community over the next couple of months. Great. I, and I just want to reiterate, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter because I may not be here, um, but should I be in this position, I think it would be really important for me to understand what that holistic plan looks like um, be prior to uh, making a decision on any school closures. Um, it might be a, a moot point, but it's something that I feel uh, should be on the record um, for how I'm thinking about grade configuration. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tran. Hi, every, everyone. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the, the, the thorough report from uh, the superintendent. I'm just like, you know, I just like to take this opportunity to thank uh, two re most recent members, Ms. Lopera and Ms. Polanco Garcia, for your commitment and uh, and your hard work along with us, serving on the committee for the last uh, several months. I hope that we'll uh, we'll be working together again, whether in the same capacity or not. Uh, it it it. It doesn't matter, but um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that we'll be working together again. Uh, since uh, Member Del Rojo uh, mentioned about the, uh, uh, the uh, vote last night on the referendum, I'd like to share some, some of my, 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 my thought on it as well. First of all, um, I would say that let the democratic uh, process uh, begin. Um, how, how long uh, will, uh, it will take to change the uh, uh, to change the the the, uh, the arrangement of the committee we don't know maybe two two years down the road whatever it is and I uh, without having concrete evidence uh, before before us um, but I do suspect that one of the factors driving the uh, decision on that referendum uh, may have been the uh, perceived or misperceived uh, notion that we serve at the pleasure, because we serve at the pleasure of the uh, of the mayor, then we are pretty much uh, beholden to the mayor on 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 all issues. 
Well, I would like to say that for the last three years that I have been working with you all, I learned a lot. And I have, uh, I, I have seen you all at, at work. I haven't seen any, anything, anything at all that show that uh, any one of you made any kind of decision that would be solely because of the prior mayor. I haven't seen that. What I have seen is that all of you have spoken, voted, um, uh, uh, shared your expertise in driving uh, projects and issues um, entirely based upon the majority consensus of the Boston community. And I respect that. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that just for saying it, but I, I'm quite sure that all of all of you, including me, of course, whatever decision we made, many decisions are very controversial. Many are tainted with uh, 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 consention or disconsension from the community, and are very hard to make. But at the end of the day, I, I, you know, in the final analysis, all those votes and decisions were made based on the best interest of the students and the desire of the, uh, you know, of the majority of the community. Um, so I appreciate that. And my, you know, I have one year left on, on, on. Uh, on uh, the committee, uh, I would not know whether, even if uh, I'm, I'm considered to, to, you know, for for returning, I don't know whether I, I want to. But you know, what I want I, I want to say is that I, I really appreciate you all, and whatever the, the conception out there, misconception out there, thank you for allowing me to work with you and allowing and 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 giving a chance, to, giving me a chance to learn from you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tran. Other comments? Mr. O'Neill? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I apologize that um, some of the impact from the storm last week did not allow me to participate in last week's meeting, uh, but I'm glad to be with my fellow members today. I did catch up on the mat as discussed, so I do appreciate um, in particular, the community meetings the superintendent is going to be holding on the schools uh, that were discussed by my fellow members. I too will be following, have been following, and will be following that issue and um, look forward to the next steps on that. And um, I agree with uh, some of the other comments that were made. We are an appointed committee. It is our job to follow the, the rules or uh, the guidelines set out by the state enabling legislation, and that is our job to do it. We are, as you said, uh, Chair Robinson, we're dedicated public servants trying to do the best that we can. Um, when you talk with governance experts across the country, including the governance expert of the Council of Great City Schools, who said there is no uh, research showing that an appointed or an elected committee is better in either way, um, but each have their strengths. and. Uh, um, he has also said that elected committees um, do tend um, to be better perceived by the community as listening to the community and appointed committees uh, tend to have more of a strategic vision. And I think we've done a lot of work on that, but we can certainly in, in hearing that feedback from him at our retreat recently you know, we can certainly uh, be doing a better job at community involvement. I know, Madam Chair, you have been leading that effort. You have had a lot of thoughts about um, how we can, can continue to improve on that because um, no matter the outcome of last night, there is still a process that involves the city council and the mayor and the state legislature and the governor. That is all, of our, all out of our hands and we can't get distracted by that. If, if the voters and elected officials decide to go another way, then so be it. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do and um, we have to continue to focus on 
hearing the voice of the community. So I really appreciate the superintendent, for example, on this issue, announcing a number of community meetings and listening to individual school communities. And lastly, um, to Ms. Lopera and Ms. Polenko Garcia, uh, you have had a very brief time in the committee, um, but your impact has already been strong. You are both individually uh, excellent new members. You have both brought separately. Um, you have obviously some overlap with both being parents, both being extremely involved in the community, both being focused on education, both being professionals yourself. Um, but the way you have uh, both gone about uh, giving feedback to the committee, asking any questions, you've each brought your, your own style and own voice to the committee as well. And I, for one, have learned by listening to your questions, listening to your comments and, and having conversations with you. So um, hopefully your time in this committee is just starting, uh, but of course, new administration, new mayors may decide to go different directions. Um, so whatever the case may be, I, I hope we are continuing to work with you as a committee member. And if not, I have no doubt that we will be working with you and listening to your voice and learning from you. So thank you, Ms. LaPera, for your work to date. And uh, Ms. Polenco Garcia, mucho gracias for the, mucho gracias for the, um, for your time and input on the committee as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Ms. Ms. Lau. Yeah, um, hi, I would like to just thank Ms. Garcia and Tara for their time here and just representing their identities in the space and greatly caring for our students. I also like really appreciate the vaccination sites since I'm an older sister, I have a younger brother that's definitely terrified of getting shots. So <laughs> providing that kind of safe family environment for children, I feel like that would make giving vaccinations so much um, safer and healthier for these kids who might be emotionally scared by these shots. Um, and of course, helping families understand the importance of getting these shots. And I'm also um, appreciative of the committee for pushing back the meeting to vote on the school stuff for next week for our community members and families and everyone to just kind of discuss this issue and sit upon it. This is a very important vote and I'm glad you guys are pushing back on voting on it until next week. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Lau. Thank you, Ms. Lau. Mr. Coleman, do you have any comments? Are you okay? You not, 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 not on this, no, 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 thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, Superintendent, I just want to join you in thanking both Mr. Andrews and Ms. Roberts for their undying commitment to the district. Um, um, they have both been amazing colleagues over the years um, and for all of their hard work in supporting us as well um, with lots of information um, over the, you know, over this time. And I just want to join you in wishing them well in their further endeavors. Um, I do look forward to hearing more about the um, testing sites for our students and um, how all of that will be working out over the next um, several weeks. So um, thank you for that as well. Um, if there are no further discussion, I would like to now entertain a motion to receive the superintendent's report. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I also just forgot to say, I also want to uh, give thanks uh, to Ms. Roberts and Mr. Andrews in particular. And I, I, I just have to say, I can't tell you how many times over the years it would bring a smile to my face when the superintendent would say, I'm gonna ask Monica Roberts to lead up with the effort on this. And as a school committee member, you would smile because you would say it's in good hands and uh, this is gonna be done right and thoughtfully et cetera. So uh, we look forward to continue to work with Ms. Roberts in her, in her new role with City Year. And we also wish uh, Mr. Andrews well in his next endeavor as well. Um, love that they were both graduates of the district and they love the district and they did excellent work. So Superintendent, uh, you have big shoes to fill and I know you're constantly working on that, but uh, thank you to Ms. Roberts and Mr. Andrews. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. 
Mr. De Rougeau? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The superintendent's report is approved unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to general public comment. Ms. Sullivan? Thank you, Chair. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for later response. Questions on specific school policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. We have 37 speakers this evening. Each person will have two minutes to speak, and I will remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not re excuse me, speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please direct your comments to the chair and refrain from addressing individual school committee members or district staff. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, please make sure you are signed into Zoom with the same name you used to sign up for public comment. That will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera when it's your turn to testify. Only speakers who turn on their camera will be allowed to testify. Otherwise, speakers can submit their testimony in writing. We'll begin this evening with Boston City Councilor Julia Mejia, and she will be followed by our speakers who will be using Spanish and then Arabic interpretation. Councilor Mejia. Can you guys hear me? We can. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Um, the, uh, thank you to the chair. My name is Julia Mejia and I'm a BPS parent and one of your four at-large city councilors. Yesterday we had a historic election and while normally things tend to slow down the week after the election day, we're keeping the momentum going because the issues that our families are experiencing every day are still going on. Over the past several weeks, we have been receiving countless emails from parents at the Sumner School who have been frustrated and confused by the lack of parent engagement and communication from the school district. This is an ongoing issue we're seeing across Boston public schools, and it has come to a head, particularly when it comes to the Sumner. Parents of the Sumner have had been led to believe that each of uh, each of the four Rosendale Elementary schools would be getting a sixth grade. However, that all changed last week when parents at the Sumner School received an email saying that they that wouldn't be the case. This was the first time in over a year that parents at the Sumner had been contacted regarding the sixth grade um, plan. Keeping in good communication with parents is essential, not just because parents rely on information to make the best decisions as possible for the children, but because it is the responsibility of Boston Public Schools to earn and keep the trust of our community. We really need to step it up when it comes to helping um, build honesty and transparency with our parents and our teachers and our students and our community. I appreciate hearing from, the, from Superintendent Casillas tonight about the upcoming community sessions 
with parents and students from the Sumner. But I hope that moving forward, we're keeping the flow of communication constant. Four, I'm not done yet. Of the four Rosendale Elementary schools without a sixth grade, the Philbrook, the Mozart, and the Fates, the summer represents half of the minority and, ha and high um, need students in Rosendale, Boston Public Schools. So I do believe we need to be looking at every possible option for the sixth grade. Oh, did you guys put me on mute? Okay, not yet. Um, when it comes to our community, and I'm really hoping that the decision that it's going to impact our kids are front and center. I seriously hope that we can take um, this instance as a learning opportunity and build community um, network um, that is grounded in communication and transparency. And, you know, this is, I feel like we keep having the same conversation um, over and over again when it comes to communication and transparency. And this is just another example of why so many parents continue to feel unseen and unheard. And so I am looking to uh, the school committee to and the superintendent to do right by the Sumner um, students, especially since I spent a little bit of time there working with parents, trying to build the Latino parent leadership uh, network there as well as the students. So I think it's due time for us to listen to those who we represent. Thank you. Thank you, counselor. We'll now move on to our speakers who will be using interpretation services. I will now turn off the interpretation icon. Interpreters and the public will all be in the main room. Interpreters, please stop interpreting and mute yourself for this part of the testimony. We'll move on to our Spanish Vamos speaking. A mover a las personas que hablan español. Our Spanish speakers, uh, Danilza Martinez. Danilza Martinez. She signed into the meeting. Please Ella, raise your hand. Si está en la reunión, por favor, levante su mano en Zoom. Okay, I don't see her signed into this meeting. No la veo en esta reunión. Let's try Sugi Scannell. Sugi Scannell. Buenas noches. Me escucha? Good evening. Sí, le escuchamos. Oh, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Suhey Escanel. Good evening. My name is Suhey Escano. Hello. Debe, de, debe encender su cámara y eh, hablar. Oh, ¿Me escucha? Sí, señora, Hello. yo le voy a estar así. Sí, señora, le voy a estar haciendo la interpretación. Oh, disculpe, es que tuve un down. problema, sí. Buenas noches a todos los miembros del Comité de las Escuelas Públicas de Boston. Gracias por la oportunidad de escucharme y permitirme abogar por mi comunidad. Mi nombre um, es Canel. ¿Me escucha? Good evening, um, members of the school committee, and thank you for the opportunity to allow me to advocate for my community. Mi nombre es Sugei Esconel. Soy madre de tres niños. Vivo en la ciudad de Rosindel y mis hijos asisten a la escuela Joseph Perry. Uh, my name is um, Mrs. Canel and I have three children that attend the Joseph Perry School. Oh, jo Joseph Perry. Uno de Yo mis amigos um, me uno a mis amigos y familia de, de la mias, escuela Plato. Mis amigos y familia de escuela Plato. Ya que como madre imagino la incertidumbre y desorientación que embarga a cada una de las familias. I um, add my voice to my um, to the members of my family of my community because of the confusion that is in their minds. Um, que mantenían la esperanza en que iban a expandir su escuela para sus hijos y que permanecieran en su escuela elemental hasta sexto grado. That they had the hope that the school 
were that the school was be expanded until sixth grade and that their children were going to remain in that school. Pero perdieron toda la fe al enterarse en la pasada reunión del comité el 27 de octubre. But they lost all hope when they heard the news on the last um, committee meeting on October 27th. Que no habían sido incluidos en la lista de expansión de, de las escuelas. That they were not included in the expansion list of schools. En el caso de los estudiantes de la escuela Blaston. In the case of the students of the Blackstone School. Cuando pasaban de quinto grado a sexto grado. El when, completo grupo los reubicaban en las escuelas Timothy e Irving. When the students, uh, when the specific schools of, the, of Blackstone were promoted to sixth grade, they were um, moved completely and reubicated into, um, ¿cuáles eran las escuelas? La Timothy y la Irving. To Timothy and Irving School. Pero lamentablemente las escuelas Timi, Timothy e Irving cerrarán sus puertas para el año 20, 2022. But unfortunately, the Timothy and the Irving School closed its doors for the year 2022. Estamos viviendo tiempos de verdaderos retos. Pues la pandemia del COVID-19 ha logrado sacarnos de la concentración en muchos aspectos. And we are living through very difficult times Unfortunately, because the COVID-19 pandemic has put us in a very tough situation. Tanto la pérdida humana como la pérdida económica han desencadenado muchos problemas, en especial en los niños. Unfortunately, the loss of life and the loss of economics have um, placed us in a very tough situation. Ya que los niños no entienden la situación. Just por because, un, just oh, because the children do not understand the situation. Se, por último, sería de gran ayuda que a las familias eh, de esas escuelas, BPS reconsidere la extensión. It would be of great help for the families of these schools if BPS reconsider their position on closing these schools. Son las escuelas Blaston, Mendel y Sumner. Muchas gracias but, por escucharme. For the schools, Blast and Mendel is Sanders. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. My next speaker is Fresilenia Rodriguez. Fresilenia Rodriguez. Señora Rodríguez, por favor, encienda su cámara y puede comenzar a hablar. Buenas noches a todos los miembros del comité que están presentes. Eh, mi nombre es Fresilenia Rodríguez. Eh, la presente es para expresar mi preocupación por la decisión a tomar eh, este año, este último año en las escuelas, en la pasada so, reunión. So, good evening to all members of the school committee. Uh, my name is Fresilenia Rodriguez, and the reason why I'm here is because I would like to express my concerns regarding the decision in the last meeting regarding the closing of the schools. Mm. Mi hija eh, y mi sobrina asisten a la escuela Blaston Elementary y me siento muy contenta y agradecida la oportunidad de que ellos estuvieran en, en una buena escuela como es la Blaston. My daughter and my niece um, are members of the Blaston School and I am very grateful that they had the opportunity of going to a very good school. Eh, mi, preocupa, eh, mi preocupación e inquietud es por qué se está pensando, eh, no se está pensando extender hasta sexto grado eh, las clases y los estudiantes tienen que ser removidos a otras escuelas. My concern is that the school is not going to be extended up to sixth grade and these students have to be moved to another school. Lo cual sería una transición muy difícil para ellos, ya que tuvieron un año muy 
frustrante, qué cosa que ellos no entienden, cuando, cuando fue la era del COVID. And that would be a very tough decision and which they do not understand. And this would be very frustrating and very hard for them because of the COVID pandemic. Los cuales tuvieron que a recibir sus clases desde el hogar. Which y they adaptar... had. Sorry. Which they had to take um, their classes from home and it was very hard for them to adapt. Adaptarse a eso, luego regresar a la escuela, eh, aprenderse el programa en la escuela y que ahora los niños tengan que entrar en otra transición, en otro proceso, eso eh, emocionalmente le afecta. So it was very hard for them to adapt to homeschooling, then return to school. That was a very hard transition. They had to learn the, new, the programs and now having to be switched to another school that is um, hard for them. Apreciamos mucho la oportunidad de que eh, se pueda extender hasta el sexto grado en la Blackstone porque realmente nos preocupamos por nuestros niños y queremos su bienestar. Espero que tomen en cuenta eso. We would greatly Gracias. appreciate that the school committee will take into consideration the extension of the sixth grade. We think that that is very good for the mental health of our students. Um, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Doris Gonzalez. La señora Doris Gonzalez, por favor, encienda su cámara y puede comenzar a hablar. Buenas noches. Good evening. Good, good evening. Uh, mi nombre es Doris Gonzalez. Vivo en Dorchester. Soy madre de dos niños que asisten a la escuela Blaston. Good evening, my name is Doris Gonzalez. I reside in Dorchester and I am the mother of two children that go to school at the Blackstone. El día de hoy quiero pedirle al distrito escolar que mi voz sea escuchada y que nuestra escuela Blackstone sea incluida para la expansión del sexto grado, ya um, que nuestra escuela solo llega hasta el quinto. Tonight, I would like to raise my voice for the school committee to reconsider extending the school up to the sixth grade because our school only um, has grading up to the fifth grade. Como madre, siento inquietud y preocupación de dónde irán a estudiar nuestros hijos. As a mother, I am concerned of where my, our children are going to end up going to school at. Ya que VPS va a cerrar las escuelas intermedias, Timothy, Irving, y la Yasso Main, mientras que la escuela Blaston, la Sumner, y la Mendel no tendrá aula de sexto grado. Because VPS is going to be closing the sound the, um, the middle schools and the students of the sounder schools will not have um, a sixth grade es lamentable es lamentable para nosotros los padres que vps no tiene ningún ningún plan para los estudiantes eh, que pasan al sexto grado del próximo año escolar it is sad for us parents that BPS does not have a plan for the students that are going to the sixth grade next year. BPS, queremos que se tome en cuenta la opinión de los padres. BPS, we would like that the parents' opinion would be taken into consideration. No queremos que nuestros niños queden como ave sin nido. We do not want our children to be like a bird without a nest. Necesitamos un sexto grado en la escuela Blaston. Muchas gracias. We need a sixth grade on the Blaston School. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Gracias. Our next speaker, Ikram, is not signed into the meeting. So that will conclude our interpretation portion. I will now activate the interpretation icon. All interpreters will be sent to your channels and you can begin interpreting again. Our next set of speakers is Jody Sugarman Brazen, Edith Brazil, Edith Brazil, Megan Wolf, Megan Wolf, and Dana Jean Stewart. If you could please raise your hands in Zoom. Dana Jean Stewart, por favor, levante. We'll begin with Jody Sugarman Brazen. Hi. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. My name is Jody Sugarman Brozan. I'm the executive director at MassCosh, the Massachusetts Coalition for Occupational Safety and Health. I live in Rosendale and I'm a BPS parent of 15 years now with a senior at Boston Latin School. And I'm here for several reasons tonight. First, I, I want to echo all of the concerns raised by parents in the Blackstone, Sumner, and Mendel schools um, as we plan, as the as BPS moves to close the Timothy Irving and Jackson Mann, we want to make sure that uh, the, the voices of parents are heard. I'm glad to hear that you're postponing for at least a week, but it seems there's a lot more planning to be done. We don't want to see a situation um, in which we are keeping moving students into places that are unsafe. Buildings are already overcrowded without room for proper social distancing. Um, and we want to urge you to think about creative solutions to find space for these sixth graders in these three schools by working with nearby community centers, churches, and businesses. And we urge you to continue to delay the vote until you have a plan and that's access, acceptable. Um, really want to um, make sure that BPS is working towards those clinics for five to 11 year olds. It was really great to hear that and including bringing information to those families in the languages that they are most comfortable. So as we plan to ask medical experts, ensuring that interpretation in multiple languages is available. And while I'm on COVID-19, I also want to make sure that I ask about how contact tracing is being done and whether it's being done done in a timely way. We are hearing reports that some schools have been informed of cases that then don't show up on the BPS website and would like to hear more information about that process. Also would like to get an update on the air quality data loggers that BPS is installing. What's the timeline? Also, what's BPS's plan for sharing that data once that the loggers collect and responding to unsafe conditions when they arise? We really urge BPS to develop a plan to ensure transparency on that. And finally, urge BPS to work with students, especially teen leaders at MassCosh on a plan for excessive heat in the spring as the spring months approach. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edith Bazell. Good evening. Sorry, my computer's a little slow. Uh, my name is Edith Bazell. Nikki Giovanni said, it is not who you attend school with, but who controls the schools you attend. In a majority BIPOC district, BPS key policy deciders for BPS are not cultural insiders and do not reflect the communities they serve. In the Build BPS plan, white school communities are rewarded with expansive repairs, swing space, and new state-of-the-art buildings while schools like the McKinley schools suffer with no gym, no library, no cafeteria, and no science labs. This is only one example of how Build BPS policymakers demonstrate a lack of concern, a lack of urgency, and a lack of racial equity. In addition to ignoring school communities that are in desperate need of repair or reconstruction, Build BPS has shown callous indifference in closing schools that disproportionately impact Black and Latinx communities. West Roxbury Educational Complex was closed without a plan, leaving families with little or no options. And this narrative is now being replayed with the Timothy and Irving closures. 
Serving students, families, and communities does not mean listening and ignoring them. It means serving their needs. Instead, you prioritize your plan, not students. Why? Chair Robinson, what is more important than knowing where your child will be attending school? The impending set of school closures affecting Black and Latinx communities without real options for rising sixth graders is unacceptable. This would not happen in certain neighborhoods that have the social, political, and economic capital. Meanwhile, Black and Latinx families are left to come to this committee begging for services, begging for options. This is wrong. Promises made and promises kept should not just apply to non-Black communities. It isn't right to speak the rhetoric of anti-racism, then use public funds to construct plans that discriminate against Black and Latinx students. BPS has a duty to prioritize students who have been historically underserved, dismissed, and mistreated. BPS finally must be a plan that includes the needs of Black and Latinx students through an equity lens and thereby stop leaving our students and communities behind. At the end of the day, if your goal is equity, it must lead back to BPS, build BPS being an equitable plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Megan Wolf. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Megan Wolf. I'm a Jamaica Plain resident, a former BPS parent, member of the grassroots parent group Quest, which is a member of the Build BPS Coalition. I'd like to testify about Build BPS, the 10-year education and facilities plan, and specifically about the equity analyses related to these plans. There have been many reasons to be concerned about Build BPS since its inception in 2017. These include that it's never been a real plan, no timetable of actions, no financial plan for the $1 billion, no educational plan regarding programs, and no analysis to understand the impacts on students, families, and neighborhoods. Followers of Build BPS have also been calling for equity analyses to determine if plans are equitable by race, socioeconomic status, neighborhood, disability, and linguistic groups. To your credit, the district has designed a racial equity toolkit and has begun to use it. Like many new learners, however, the district still needs improvement in their work. The consequences for their poor performance are serious and related to all kinds of decisions we're hearing talked about tonight. If I were the teacher of, Bill of BPS, I would have to cite the following weaknesses. To start, the answers in the toolkit forms don't address the questions being asked. This is a huge red flag. The answers rarely address whether an action will be harmful to vulnerable students and communities, but instead list how the district will try to mitigate for the inequitable, inequitable decision being made. For example, in the case of the Irving and Timothy, the analyses don't address whether the closings unfairly burden the majority black and brown students of the schools, but instead talk about how the students will receive priority in upcoming lotteries. Other concerns include that the equity analysis fails to use data when making broad claims, and then answers are often vague and misleading. In the analysis of the closing of the Jackson Man, the district says there will be no financial savings for FY20, but make no mention of years beyond. If properly used, the equity toolkit should ensure that stakeholders are involved. They really haven't been. In short, the use of the analyses is inadequate and deeply disappointing. The consequences of this are very real. Decisions are made without full consideration of the impact on groups by race, socioeconomic status, or neighborhood, and without full regard for disability or language learner status. The district must do better for any decisions being made. And by the way, links to some of the district's equity analyses can be found on the Quest Facebook page at Quest BPS and soon on our website at questparents.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Our next speaker is Dana Jean Stewart.
Good evening, Madam Chair. My name is Dana Jean Stewart and I reside in Charlestown. I'm the co-chair of Warren Prescott School Site Council, a member of the Warren Prescott Parent Association, and I've been a proud parent of two students there for over the last eight years. I'm speaking tonight to ask for your support in securing a new play space for the Warren Prescott K-8 school in Charlestown. Over the course of the eight years I spent watching students play on the structure, I've also seen it deteriorate and become more limiting as parts of the structure started to break and become unavailable for replacement. We currently have a structure in complete disrepair that has lost almost all its play features due to either unavailable part replacements, rust, or unsafe features that are now boarded up. Not only does this structure serve as an outlet for the 550 students attending Warren Prescott, but as an outlet for the entire community of Charlestown and other surrounding neighborhoods. Outside of the structure, we have a paved area for the kids to play kickball and basketball, yet its surface is cracked and uneven, which creates a very unsafe play space for the students. We rely heavily on this outdoor space given the fact we don't have a gymnasium. The play space is used for PE classes, movement classes, before and after school programming, and summer school. Warren Prescott has recently applied for a grant through the Community Preservation Act, which will provide funding for a new playground for our school. If awarded and approved, the grant will come before the school committee, and I'm asking for your support in approving this grant for us. While we wait patiently to learn if we are awarded this grant, I'm also asking that you make the repairs needed to our current play structure a priority. It's unacceptable that so many students and community members don't have a safe play structure accessible to them. The structure is more than 20 years old and does not support some of our youngest K0, K1, and K2 students, nor does it support the needs of our autism strand. We are left without a space to engage in safe play, which is needed now more than ever to support our students' social emotional well-being and mental health struggles that were only heightened through the pandemic. Thank you again for your support. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. I'd like to remind all of our speakers to please try to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Our next set of speakers is Cornelia Griggs, Lorraine Zanetta, Allison Cox, Rachel Young, Allison Friedman, Amanda Lucan, and Lauren Peter. If you could all please raise your hands virtually in Zoom so we can identify you. We'll begin with Cornelia Griggs. My name is Dr. Cornelia Griggs and I'd like to echo some of the sentiments of Dana Jean. I'm a kindergarten parent at the Warren Prescott School um, in Charlestown. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Warren Prescott students and community. I would like to highlight the advocacy efforts of the Warren Prescott Playground Committee, which was organized to address the urgent need for a new play structure at our school. Built over 20 years ago for a student population, a fraction of the size of our current student body, the existing playground is currently in severe disrepair. Portions of the structure are boarded up and inaccessible. The rusting monkey bars are impractical and beyond the reach of the younger students who use the structure most. The swaths of hard pavement surrounding the playground are cracked and jagged. In short, the current play space and play yard is frankly dangerous in areas and uninviting for students at all grade levels at best. For our neurodivergent students with autism, the playground is patently unsafe. Our community has written an application to the Boston Community Preservation Plan in hopes of securing funding for a revitalized playground and play space. With a burgeoning population and ever increasing demand for elementary school spots, the Charlestown community has never had a greater need for safe, educational, and inviting play spaces for children. As a pediatric surgeon in the community, I have seen a sharp uptick in the diagnoses of motor and behavioral delays in children who were cooped up inside throughout the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. A renovated playground and play space in our school is the best next step to address these deficits. It is said that play is the work of children. Playgrounds are not simply for leisure. 
Playgrounds are essential to the emotional, social, and physical development of children and essential to their learning, especially in urban schools. As a public school that serves an extremely diverse community of students and families from all over Boston, we ask the Boston School Committee to offer their support in our efforts to advocate on behalf of the Warren Prescott students and family. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lorraine Zanata. Good evening, committee members. My name is Lorraine Zanata, and I'm a board certified behavior analyst that oversees the autism program at the Warren Prescott School in Charlestown. The Warren Prescott School community is seeking a grant to renovate our play structure and playground. Our current structure is damaged beyond repair and has never met the needs of our growing autism program. The WP Autism Strand serves students ages three to 14 that live in many neighborhoods across our diverse city. Students with autism benefit greatly from movement and gross motor activities. Outdoor play addresses their many sensory issues and is the gateway for building functional communication skills, such as asking for more, as in pushes, spins, or slides, and their social engagement. We do not have an area to safely meet the needs of our students, many of whom are high energy and seek sensory stimulation throughout the day. Access to outdoor play often translates into increased attending and development of fine motor skills in the classroom. We are in dire need of repair to our current play structure, as well as grant funding from the Community Preservation Act for the new play structure. Please support our growing autism program and the students and community of Charlestown. We appreciate your dedication to the WP students and community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Allison Cox. My name is Allison Cox. I live in Jamaica Plain. I'm a parent and family representative on the Mission Hill School Governance Board. I'm here again tonight because I remain hopeful that this body and others listening from the district are hearing us. And as decision makers, you remain open to the fact that in spite of recent news of challenges from the past, Mission Hill has been and can again be seen as an asset to the district. I understand that last week, Superintendent Casilius ended the equity roundtable with a comment that we haven't reckoned with how we hold autonomous schools accountable when they choose curriculum and hiring. I'm not arguing that Mission Hill school, school should be free from accountability. The Autonomous Schools Manual spells out the school quality review process for pilot schools. Since my family joined, joined the school in 2019, I have not seen hesitation or opposition to that process from the school. What I have seen is our school and its governance board welcome support and collaboration with the district when it's been done in ways that do not dis disenfranchise our community. I said this last week, but I think it's worth repeating tonight. Last year, a member of the superintendent, superintendent's office at, at our governance board request took the lead in writing the evaluation of our school leaders. The reviews were positive. We had no indication of issues until the superintendent removed them a few weeks later. Trust and accountability are a two-way street. This week, the school's governance board and staff were briefed on the emergency school review process. Our teachers are doing incredible things in, our, in their classrooms, but this is a hard year for our school. And it feels un un unfair to assess a school at a time when its leaders and senior teachers have very recently been removed. I understand the review goes back a few years, but I'm unconvinced that assessing any school and how well it performed during the height of the pandemic is all that meaningful. I'd further argue that some of the things that make Mission Hill special and successful, like its split grade classrooms and its deep commitment to both inclusion and collaboration, made remote and hybrid learning especially difficult. I have concerns on how valuable this review can possibly be and worry about the decisions its conclusions will be used to justify. I ask that you please commit to seeing all of our school and support us where we have faults, but do not support dismantling this amazing community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Young.
Hi, good evening. I, I realize there are a lot of um, testifiers this evening and it's hard to listen to everyone. So I, I appreciate the attention you're giving us and our community. Um, so my name is Rachel Young. I'm a mom to a second grader at the Sumner and a few Sumner parents are here tonight to talk about our desire to have a sixth grade for next year, 2022-23 school year. Um, we're going to talk this evening a little about the history of this effort to get the sixth grade, um, because we realize many of you may not be aware of this history as you're new to the committee or you're just new to BPS. And we're just going to talk a little about the running theme this evening about stakeholder engagement and equity. Um, for me, to, I'm just going to talk personally for a moment. Um, I think it was a real gut punch when we found out that we weren't getting a sixth grade. I, we had such a good relationship with BPS two years prior. And even the communication that I've had with the superintendent and her team over other issues this past year, um, again, it was just shocking and really disappointing. Um, and so it makes it really hard for us to trust BPS going forward. You know, we're gonna have really hard conversations in the weeks to come. And I honestly don't know if I'm gonna be able to process and, um, and believe the information that we're given from the Build BPS team. And that's unfortunate. Uh, today, we did have a building tour with Build PPS, so thank you to those that made that possible. We really appreciate that. We're reestablishing this dialogue from two years ago. Um, and if you walked through the school, I'm hoping you got an opportunity to see everything that makes it special, you know, to our, you know, our, our fantastic outdoor classroom that the parents and children work on every year to, you know, maybe you got to see one of our theater classes in process. It's a really special school, and we all deserve credit for that. Um, so, why are we here this evening? We could just be home taking a rest after what we consider a small success. But I think for the Sumner community, um, it's very important for us to be here advocating as a community and to take this spotlight that we have or the small pulpit that we have and make sure that we're advocating for everyone, not just ourselves. And so tonight we're here in unity with the Mendel and the Blackstone communities. We wanna make sure that everyone, not just our school is getting the attention they deserve. Um, and we're also here this evening because we know that this is where the hard work really begins. Uh, cha space challenges aren't just about space, they're about politics. And so we're asking everyone here, the Build BPS community, the school committee, elected officials, to really flex your muscles, your political muscles, your community, the political will to have these difficult conversations that we're going to have imminently. That's where we really need you the most to make sure that this happens um, with the urgency that it deserves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Young. Our next speaker is Allison Friedman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I'm Allison Friedman. I'm a sub, I've been a Sumner parent for seven years. Um, so I'm going to be the one who does some of the history of the sixth grade conversations that have been happening. Um, in 2019, we had a lot of conversations with the district about uh, getting a sixth grade and into the winter of 2020. Um, and the main things that we were told was that the district was not interested in one-off sixth grades because it affects whole feeder patterns. And so they were only really interested in doing um, an entire network because of equity reasons. Um, and then we were also told that the district would look at creative space solutions because we do have a lot of kids in a, in a building that's big, but not big enough for the number of kids for adding sixth grade easily. Um, and so we were really looking at the community center at that point, um, and then it flooded, and then we had a pandemic. So the laws of nature sort of got in the way. Um, but then we were very surprised that I, in this round of communications about sixth grade, that those two things did not happen. Um, but I have hope that we can now fix this and have those things happen. And those are the very same things that I would want to ask for now is that sixth grade is granted to everybody in the feeder pattern at the same time for equity reasons. Um, and then also that we look at creatively at spaces. I was one of the people on the walkthrough today and was at the school and was super grateful for that experience to like get to talk to people higher up in BPS um, directly about our space and our needs. Um, and uh, on that tour, we definitely talked about the possibility again of using the community center. There is like because of the flood actually, some spaces may have opened up that weren't even there before. Um, possibly if the community center isn't 
uh, available soon enough using the Irving building in the meantime, um, while it's not being renovated yet. Um, and so I, we asked in that meeting, I asked to have the BPS staff uh, reach out to the BCYF staff because we've had trouble connecting with the community center because they're not open right now. Um, and I think it needs to go to higher level people than the people who are like the manager of the site. So that's one of the things that we're looking for um, that conversation starting to happen by the time we get to our community meetings that you're having down the road. Um, and the other thing that I think I would be looking for um, is that uh, District, district staff like noticed in our walkthrough that there are a lot of spaces that are oddly configured in the Sumner um, because it's such an old building. Um, so if walls need to come down, move that sort of thing, I'm hoping that wouldn't be a barrier to getting this a sixth grade because it's not that expensive. So thank you very much for that opportunity. I just want to let you know what we're looking for down the road because we've been asking for you to push off the vote until certain things happen. Um, and those are the sorts of things that we're looking for. Thank you, Ms. Friedman. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amanda Lucan. Amanda? Sorry, <laughs> just a little bit of a lag, <laughs> slow Wi-Fi connection. Um, good evening, uh, my name is Amanda Lukens and I'm a resident of Roslindale and I want to thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you this evening. Like Allison, I have been a Sumner Elementary School parent for seven years and currently have a third grader at the school. Last week, like all of us, I received notice that a sixth grade pathway had not been identified for our students in the face of the Irving School's closure. In the following days, I learned that the Blackstone and Mendel School communities received a similar notification due to the proposed closure of the Timothy School. I wanted to speak tonight of my disappointment and frustration at the lack of engagement and communication ahead of these recent Build BPS announcements. The district had an opportunity to engage with stakeholders from our schools to develop the sixth grade pathway proposal, but failed to do so. The racial equity planning tool specifically asks, who are the stakeholders most impacted by the proposal and how have we involved them and those from historically marginalized communities in developing the proposal. Unfortunately, this work did not happen. This involvement did not happen leading up to the announcement last week. I do want to acknowledge the superintendent's efforts in this last week to start to address this lack. Thank you, Superintendent Caselius, for making moves to right this wrong. However, I also want to emphasize my regret that these conversations did not happen earlier. We now face a sense of urgency and haste to come up with solutions and reassure our communities on this topic. Unfortunately, this urgency also means that we are more likely to fail to authentically engage all of our stakeholders, especially those who are the most marginalized and too often left out. And frankly, this only perpetuates white supremacy culture. I hope this can be an opportunity to learn and do better, to do the work to rebuild trust, bring transparency and engage stakeholders, authentically engage stakeholders earlier in the decision-making processes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lauren Peter, followed by Ruby Reyes, Kate Markowitz, Bill Barrar, Andy Rosen, and Mimi Lai. If you could please raise your hands in Zoom. Lauren Peter. Thank you for the 
Thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, hi, my name is Lauren Peter. I'm a proud Sumner parent and a Roslindale resident. Um, last week, many families uh, around the city were able to breathe easy as they found their child would continue to stay in a beloved school community for another year. As you mentioned earlier, it's school choice season and the Sumner will have their first open house um, in 12 short days. Our fifth graders and those at the Blackstone and the Mendel should be focusing on fun and schoolwork. And now they're going to be focusing on where they're going to be going next year um, because their pathway is gone and they won't be with their community um, as things stand. We really um, are thankful that the engagement has started but as I said, our first open house is in 12 days. Um, this is going to affect how our enrollment happens for next year. It's going to affect how parents view us as maybe they have children at other K through eights in the area. Maybe they're going to use sibling preference to pull their children out. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk about both our fifth graders, the children of the Irving and the, the Timulty and the Blackstone and the Mendel and think about not encourage you to think about all of these things and think about that holistic plan that you were talking about and and really really engage our communities on what is best for our students and what will reduce the reduce the changes that they have to go through we all know that this year has been hard on them this these past few years have, have has been hard on them and less transitions, the better. And if we can keep them in their communities for one more year, that would be great. And as you begin to make your seven through 12 plan, like it just doesn't seem like things are great for the kids that are going to be affected by this right now. Um, so I appreciate your engagement. Um, I just would really think about the equity that is affecting the students who are gonna be affected by this right now not the ones who are gonna be affected by this in a few years. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ruby Reyes. Um, I think the Cape Verdean Creole interpreter is using the English channel. Uh, my name is Ruby Reyes, and I'm the director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance. Beja is a member of the Build BPS Stakeholders Group. Once again, we demand a moratorium on school closures and major facility decisions until an equity analysis of the impact on Black and Latino communities is completed. Since first released in 2017, we have been requesting missing information, including swing space, financial reports, estimated costs for rebuilds, relocation, maintenance, program expansions, and educational plans for proposed school reconfigurations, which include feeder plans. The current plan does not include any of these specifics. A study showed the home-based assignment adopted in 2013 has widened racial inequities and in access to quality schools. The home-based assignment saves only pennies on transportation and does not contribute to a comprehensive quality education. It is disingenuous to use a bus driver and monitor shortage to justify revisiting school assignment. Closing schools without an equitable, equitable plan, like what is happening with the Irving and Timulty, will increase transportation costs. It is ineffective to fabricate transparency when you have not done the work to determine the impact on the Blackstone, Sumner, and Mendel students who will have to withstand the worst of these decisions. We still do not have information about the impact of the closure of West Roxbury's educational complex. What happened to those students, parents, and educators? What were the support services costs that went to ensure these students experienced academic success? Where are those costs factored into the transportation savings? 20 seconds. After meeting, families and school committee members ask for additional information and input on the decisions being made for schools. It seems there is more of an effort spent on creating false narratives rather than legitimate transparency and doing the work required to create systemic change. 
Where is the priority of equity in decision making and using the district's own equity tool with fidelity? These continued inequities are baked into build BPS and will result in even larger achievement and opportunity gaps pre and now post COVID. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kate Markowitz. Good evening. Um, my name is Kate Markowitz, and I'm a parent of both a K-2 and a second grade student at the Sumner Elementary School in Roslindale. And I wanna reiterate um, that closing the Irving um, has a ripple down effect as well as closing the Timulty that eliminates a pathway not only for our school, but also the Blackstone and the Mendel. Um, and this will create a downward spiral and harm all of the communities as parents move their children out of these schools or do not select them um, as incoming parents, which further hurts our budget and then hurts our schools. Since the testimonies from other parents and myself last week, Boston Public Schools has now restarted dialogues with the schools. Thank you, that's great. Um, as Amanda mentioned though, I wish that had happened before. Um, and we hope this will continue these conversations and help to rebuild trust and address equity. This dialogue needs to be authentic two-way and proceed with the utmost of urgency. We should be entitled to the same space standards as the other schools that are receiving sixth grades and ensure equity. Today, BPS visited our school and expressed a shared priority for finding a sixth grade space. In order to do so, I ask that BPS commit to examining every space in our building and determining which spaces can be reconfigured to make more classroom spaces as ideally we would like to house the sixth grade in our own building. I also ask that the district follow through on looking into utilizing the Roslindale Community Center and or the RMV space. BPS did agree today to help facilitate communicating with BCYF and the RMV. And I ask that they work to make this communication happen with expediency. I asked the school committee to delay voting on the Irving closure in order to allow BPS and the Sumner community to explore this possibility as well as the possibility of using the Irving to house our sixth grade for the 2022-2023 school year in the event that the community center cannot accommodate us until after the 2022 school year starts. I ask that BPS, the superintendent and the school committee hold our school financially harmless for the expected population reduction this uncertainty will have, as well as for the Blackstone and Mendel communities, especially if BPS is unable to find a way for us to have a sixth grade next year. We deserve all staff positions to continue to be funded fully. It is unfair to create a pathway for other schools and not the Blackstone, Mendel, and the Sumner. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bill Barrar. Good evening, my name is Bill Barra. I'm a Sumner parent and a West Roxbury resident. I wanted to speak tonight about the need for a sixth grade at the Sumner. And you know, I wanted to stress that it's, it's really important that the dialogue we have over the next few months, um, the equality dialogue, and one where the committee doesn't make assumptions about, about the needs of, of, of the Sumner community. Um, I got to listen to the, to the presentation last week and you know what, what jumped out at me um, you know, was there was one statistic that was repeated several times uh, through, throughout the presentation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what it said was, was, was that um, families ask for a path, but they don't use it. And, and the statistic referenced was that less than 20% of Sumner fifth graders move along their assigned path to the Irving. Now, if there had been a dialogue um, before, that, before that statistic was used, which was, and that was really held up as proof that families don't want a path, that they don't use it. You know, there, there was a, the presenter gave a quote that said, in the early grades, in first and second grade, families say they want a path, but then they don't use it. Now, if you had spoken to our community, the why, the why that number is so low, why only 20% of fifth graders are actually going on to the Irving, 
the, the Sumner community, the parents could have told you, hey, um, system-wide decisions have hollowed out the urban. Um, you know, there's a focus on seven to 12 and that, that's fine. But the fact is that's gonna steer students away from elementary schools. And in fact, engaged families are, are trying to avoid that grades five, six, and seven at different schools, avoid that scenario early on way before they even get to fifth grade. So that hollows out the Irving. You know, the writing has been on the wall about the Irving since before my child even got involved in the Sumner over four years ago. So you know, I really feel like, you know, if you don't understand the context of some of these situations, please talk to us. You know, that there, there, there needs to be a dialogue. Um, so I'd appreciate that very much going forward. Thank you. Thank you. My next speaker is Andy Rosen. Hello, uh, I am Andy Rosen. I'm a Rosendale resident and uh, father of a K-2 student So uh, at the Sumner. Um, so this is my family's first year at the Sumner School, so I don't have anywhere close to the expertise and uh, history that you all share. Um, having grappled with this question of sixth grade um, at this school and, and elsewhere, but I hope that my perspective as a newcomer can be some help. Um, Whatever you're doing at the Sumner is working great from what I can see. It's a fabulous place and my son is really happy there. And it was very jarring to have to start worrying about his future just, you know, a couple weeks into the relationship. Um, so I'm hopeful that you'll have the sixth grade issue figured out by the time my son, who's six years old almost, is ready for middle school. But I'd be really sad to see the older kids leave without a plan that gives them the same support that the educators at Sumner have provided for so many years to those particular kids. And I also worry about whether the school can continue to thrive if this uncertainty hurts enrollment. Um, I have similar worries for the students, families, and educators at Blackstone and Mendel, and I've gotten to know some of them through this process so far, and you'll hear from that group separately later. Um, but I know these questions of space and facilities are not easy and I can see how hard everyone's working on them, but, and I'm looking forward to being part of those discussions um, over how we might find room for a sixth grade at Sumner and the other schools that want it. But uh, I really hope you'll take the time and slow down and figure this out so you can serve all of our students uh, before you make any irreversible decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mimi Lai, followed by Sarah Wharton, Dr. Karen Walker Gregory, Mike Heishman, Sharon Hinton, Andrew Eiliff, and Barbara Fields. If you could please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Mimi Lai. Good evening. Can you see me and hear me? Good evening. Do you have your camera on, Mimi? Uh, unfortunately, I do have it on. Mm. I apologize, I do have my computer, I mean, my camera on. So should I continue okay. to testify? Uh, you can continue, is that okay, Chair? I'm getting yeah, in Yeah, that's fine. All right, yeah. thank you. I apologize, Thanks. thank you. Good evening, my name is Mimi Lai and I am a resident of Rosendale and a K-1 parent at the Sumner. Last winter, I started a Facebook group to recruit new families to BPS. Throughout the pandemic, we supported each other through the registration process and encouraged each other to explore schools with open minds. Now we number over 700 families, 
representing neighborhoods from all over Boston. The first deadline for K-1 and sixth grade registration is January 28th and school tours are happening now. I think it's imperative that you communicate your intentions about the Sumner Blackstone and Mendel transparently and expeditiously so families can make informed decisions. I also wanna back up the legitimate concerns that Sumner parents have about lowered enrollment. Having a sixth grade, a middle school pathway is a question parents often ask during school tours and can influence how they rank schools. So I was very alarmed to hear that the Sumner would be the only Rosendale school without a sixth grade. Even before the pandemic and definitely during the pandemic, the lottery assignment and waitlist policies have had the most negative impact on Sumner, the largest school in Rosendale. Because even if a handful of families that were assigned to the Sumner decide to move on to a different school, what will result is months of shuffling. It's like musical chairs, but when the music stops, the Sumner ends up with empty seats through no fault of their own. This ultimately can affect their enrollment and funding. However, if you promise that the budget for next year will not be impacted by dips in enrollment, and if you make a good faith effort in listening to what the Sumner community wants, that would really help with recruiting and retention efforts and be very reassuring for many families. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Wharton. Hi there. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your time. My name is Sarah Wharton. I live in the North End and am the parent of two BPS students at the Elliott, a third grader and a K-2-er. This evening, I'm joining this meeting to speak on the pressing topic of needed investment in BPS high schools. While the exam schools are important and a strong source of pride in our school system, it's time to look beyond these three schools to other open enrollment high schools that could also use attention. I've spoken before this committee previously about the need for more inclusion high schools in the BPS system. And tonight, again, I urge the school committee to prioritize the addition of inclusion high schools in our system. Inclusion high schools ensure students with disabilities and language learners alike, as well as their other classmates, all benefit from diversity in their peer community. My kids enjoy the privilege of attending an inclusion school, and we would love the opportunity for this broadened understanding and acceptance of differences to continue into their teen years through the option of attending an inclusion high school in their next steps. To this point, we appreciate the scale of work the school committee and superintendent's office undertake, and would like to address the idea of piloting change specifically at Charlestown High School. We have a community ready to begin a transition to make Charleston High into an inclusion innovation high school for September of 2022. The ability to improve an existing underutilized high school will directly impact students' day-to-day -day education, as well as their future options as we look to provide new and improved career and college pathways for those students. The ability to pilot this one school that's ready to move quickly for September 2022 is both a special opportunity not to be missed, as well as a testament to the significant, strong family and community support behind this idea. We look for support from you all as we hope to begin this change in the months ahead. Thank you again for your time and all your work on behalf of our students. Good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Karen Walker Gregory. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Well, Madam Chair, Superintendent, and members of the school committee, good evening and happy Wednesday. My name is Karen Walker Gregory. I am the proud head of school of the Edward M. Kennedy Academy for Health Careers for 22 years, and I've been in the district for 32 years. 
I'm also a graduate of the Boston Public Schools. I'm here to bring you joy. Thanks to Will Austin, the Chief Executive Officer of Boston School Funds, the Commonwealth article written by Kerry Donahue, Chief Strategy Officer of the Boston School Fund, the support of the school committee, the leadership of the superintendent, and her amazing team, Megan Costello, Sam DePina, Brian Ford, and Ted, Dr. Ted Lombardi. We are finalizing the paperwork to secure a space at 384 Warren Street in Roxbury. The space will house our 11th and 12th grade students for the next five years as a short-term solution. The space was formerly occupied by Roxbury Prep Charter School and currently houses Teen Empowerment, a great partner. The school is designed to house about 200 students, which is perfect. Obviously, this is a short-term solution and we need all stakeholders to continue to advocate for a new school building to house our grades seven through 12. The five-year licensure agreement should give us enough time for, to, to build a new school building for our EMK community as we continue to prepare for our young people for the health professions. Thanks again for all that you do to support BPS students, families, and teachers. I am truly grateful. Have a great evening and thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Heishman. Am I on? Yes, good evening. All right. Mike Heisman, Beja, Dorchester. At these meetings, I hear parents screaming. There should be no more school closings until so these decisions would provide our children with a promise of a brighter future. Bill PPS was advertised as a bold plan that would modernize our facilities. If this is a plan, why every year have you created so much pain and suffering? Build BPS should be renamed Close BPS or destroy hearts and minds BPS. The school department must stop closing our schools and dumping our children into God knows where. Where are the equity analysis on these decisions on Black and Latinx communities? There should be a moratorium on school closures and major facilities decisions. Is it possible that one or more schools could create a vision for a school that is far superior than the one created by central office? I know firsthand that the answer is yes. Deborah Meyer, MacArthur Genius Award winner, was recruited to start a new school in Boston, which opened in 1997. My daughter was one of the founding students that year. That wonderful school is the Mission Hill Pilot School. I wish that you would give me more time to rave about the greatness of that school. Something terrible happened to some of our children at Mission Hill. An investigation was held and action was taken. My daughter expressed high regards to the two co-leaders who have been placed on administrative leave. At recent meetings, many current Mission Hill parents have complained about what central office has done to the school since the beginning of the year. It seems like this once great school is in now in terrible shape. Many of these parents have called on our superintendents to protect their school's autonomy and their democratic school governance. I stand in support of the Mission Hill community and ask that steps be taken to repair the damage the central office has done. The superintendent should reassure Mission Hill that their autonomy and democratic governance will be protected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Hinton. Here we go. Okay. Good evening. I'm Sharon Hinton, mother of a BPS graduate 
educator and Hyde Park resident. First, I'd like to thank Mayor Kim Janey and congratulate Mayor-elect Michelle Wu and the entire Wu team for yesterday's historic win, breaking barriers in Boston where public school education actually began. Secondly, I wanna express my thanks and gratitude to those school committee members who are continuing to do this most important work despite the many challenges, as well as to thank those school committee members who may be leaving shortly in order to give others the opportunity to serve. Lastly, I just wanna ask if the Boston School Committee will hold community feedback sessions similar to those held during the exam school admissions process in order to receive community input regarding question three in light of yesterday's election results that showed an overwhelming, <clears throat> excuse me, that showed an overwhelming percentage of Boston voters want the school committee to return to an elected body, as well as the mayor elects expressed interest in a hybrid model of governance for the school committee, even though there is no evidence of a successful hybrid school committee model in a city comparable to the size of Boston. I thank you for listening to me. Thank each member of the committee and hope to be working with you again in the middle of me getting my doctorate of education at Northeastern University. God bless, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Isla. Hi everyone, Chad Robinson. My name is Andrew Eilif, I live in Jamaica Plain. I'm a parent of Boston Latin Academy and Mission Hill School, where I'm also a family representative on the school's governing board. The governing board has still not been able to reach quorum due to staff concerns about the district's actions and abruptly suspending four of their colleagues. But earlier this week, the non-staff members of the board were summoned with 24 hours notice to a meeting with the district's representatives to be told about the forthcoming emergency school review to be conducted at Mission Hill this month. I left this meeting more convinced than ever that the district's goal is to dismantle our school. We were told that the review would consider trends over the past three years at the school. Three years in which the school changed leadership, endured a global pandemic that forced children and staff out of the building to contend with learning over Zoom, the loss of our school's leaders without warning as we began the critical work of preparing to return to something like normal school, followed by the loss of two of the school's most experienced, most beloved and respected teachers on the second day of classes who were suspended, it bears repeating, when they received letters while busy teaching their classes. Our school, like every school in the entire world, struggled to manage the immense disruption of COVID-19 for nearly two years of the period we are now told will be reviewed for trends. As we were beginning the work of recovering from COVID, we lost both our formal leadership and some of the key institutional memory and heart of our school. At this point, a review is like assessing the performance of a ship hit by a tidal wave. Yet the district's representatives were entirely unable to share how they plan to distinguish the impact of the immense external shocks to our school from the trends they are supposedly looking for. Indeed, the representative managing the review admitted that they had never, in years of conducting such reviews for both the district and DESE, conducted a review at such short notice and in such a compressed time frame. In these circumstances, this review is absurd, or worse, an attempt to gather further ammunition in the district's case against our school to support a decision, one that feels at this point all but inevitable, to either close the school or remove its pilot status and take away what has made Mission Hill unique and a nationally celebrated model of progressive pedagogy. I hope I'm wrong, I really do. If the school committee took an active interest in this review and the district's high-handed management of our school, our community could believe that our school was being fairly and impartially evaluated instead of being the district's scapegoat. Thanks for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Fields. She'll be followed by Dennis Wilson, Louis Elisa, Zulika Soto, Avery Salnier de Reyes, Roxy Harvey, and Rosalba Chino. If you could please raise your hands in Zoom. Ms. Fields. Can you see and hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I can't see you. Okay. 
Uh, good evening. My name is Barbara Fields. I am a member of Bill BPS Stakeholders Coalition, and I reside in Mattapan. Uh, I would like to spend my time to just ask this committee if you would abide uh, by your policy of ensuring that each uh, policy or recommendation that comes before you has an equity analysis. There was a reason why that we all felt that that was very important when it came before school committee to become a part of your implementation plan around the opportunity gap, because we felt that that was a way in which you would have the information before you so the decisions that you made would be non-discriminatory, it would be equitable, and the decisions would be in the best interest of all children. You have implemented that policy, but you have not ensured that in fact, the questions that are posed, the information that is required is included. So I think you continue to perpetuate decisions and policies that have a disproportionate impact on our black and brown children. There is a pattern and it's a long going pattern that continues around who is served and who is not served in our district. The impact of these decisions that you're making continues to perpetuate inequities. If we look at our school closings, if we look at the students that are constantly disrupted, when we look at even now when you're closing the Timothy and you're making other moves in the district, who are those children that are being impacted? Are they the same children that were impacted when they were in elementary schools? You know, we really need to look at that. So I joined with other members of the coalition in asking, oh, see my time is up, in asking uh, that you put a moratorium on these decisions that you are making until you have the equity analysis accurately filled out that gives you the information to inform your decision-making. And thank you very much. And sorry, I went over. Thank you, Ms. Fields. Our next speaker is Dennis Wilson. Mr. Wilson, are you with us? Okay, let's try Sulika Soto. Okay, uh, here we go. Can you hear me, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. Uh, VPS graduate, don't blame it on that, two degrees, but still can't spell IT. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> I just want to uh, thank each and every one of you uh, school committee members and ladies and gentlemen for giving me the opportunity to speak on something just near and dear to me. Uh, I am a VPS as well, a VPS graduate. Proud to say, not giving up the years uh, of, of Blue and blue, tried and true, English high, or English high. And I'm also 39 years at the school that I also love so dearly, Madison Park Tech Boat High School. Uh, and again, uh, this is something that I hope uh, is, is becomes near and dear to you as it is to me. Uh, I represent the Friends of Madison. I'm the co-chair of the Friends of Madison, which is a group of educators and community activists and supporter and lover of children who have been working for many years on saving Madison and making Madison uh, a school, a vocational school, the one and only vocational school that we could be proud of. The city uh, of Boston uh, providing our young people uh, a top flight, first class, quality, high quality 
tech folk school, which they so deserve and the city deserves. Um, and career opportunities that are provided across the state at other Vogue Tech high schools. Unfortunately, the city and the school committee and, uh, and the prior school committees have not yet taken this seriously enough. The Bill B PS plan does not even include Madison, which I find that disturbing and a travesty. Again, I repeat, the one and only Vogue Tech, Career Vogue Tech School. It does not include the hands-on facility and improvements uh, in the, in the, and exposure to the lower grades that would prepare younger students for skilled education. Most of the 20 programs at Madison Park are badly in need of facility improvements as, mo as more students, we were getting increasingly more enrollment and more students and parents are choosing Madison Park because they see the value of tech book education and, and also the wave of the future. Madison Park, uh, the, the equipment is antiquated, low, low in consumables. Uh, again, uh, supplies is, 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 not, is, is definitely in need as well as like I said, steady equipment is other schools. As grades seven and eight are added, there is a dis desperate need for appropriate classrooms and expanded shops. Excuse me, Mr. Now Jones. is the time, and now it is our opportunity to create the first class facility for Boston that our children deserve, deserve that the community deserves, and Madison most definitely deserves. So I, 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 I ask that you, ladies and gentlemen, really consider this and thank you for listening. Uh, again, our children in the city of Boston deserve the best. And let's give our children the best tech book education and experience as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. You're very welcome. Our next speaker, Louis Elisa, is not signed into the meeting. So we'll move on to Salika Soto. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Suleika Soto. I am a Blackstone parent and I reside in the South End. I will be here summing up today a lot of what you heard from um, Blackstone, Mandel and Sumner parents. Um, so we are a group of families and educators from the Blackstone, Mandel and Sumner schools who have been meeting in recent days to come up with a collective approach to advocacy. We are asking you not to close the Timothy and Irvin until our schools have a plan for sixth grade that gives our children the stability you are seeking for children throughout the district. We share your desire to reduce the frequency of school transitions, and that's what we want for our kids too. Before you move forward with these middle school closures, we ask that you take the time to engage with the family, students, and educators. I understand you've already done this um, at some schools, the Sumner and the Mendel, but that has not been the case at the Blackstone. Though each of our schools is different, all of us know that our facilities could support a sixth grade. Please treat this issue with the urgency it deserves. Even as the grownups worry about the questions of budget, staffing, and space, there are three classes of fifth graders who still don't know what's going to happen to them next year, or if they will be with their friends, teachers, or support staff. Our kids, resilient as they are, deserve our best efforts to avoid more uncertainty and unnecessary transitions, especially coming out of the pandemic. Despite the thriving staff and programs in our schools, families are going to take a note if we don't have a straightforward answer about what happens after fifth grade. Every other school, elementary school in the city will be able to answer that question today. 
Even one year of reduced enrollment could have disastrous consequences for our school's finances. If you move forward without a plan for sixth grade continuity, you could begin a cycle of decline and neglect that ends with our schools suffering the same fates as the Timothy and the Irving. At the very least, we would ask that you protect our schools from financial consequences for enrollment disruptions next year, given the unique circumstances that we are facing. That would allow us to engage in the process from a place of trust and confidence. Many of us were surprised by the sudden acceleration of this process because each of our schools has had productive conversations about sixth grade options that go back in some cases for years, except for the Blackstone. We learned of the school system's intentions, not from our principals at the Blackstone or at the Sumner, but through a mass email from Superintendent Caselius. Please work with us and our school leaders to quickly find a way to add sixth grades to our schools. Our children deserve no less. Please don't vote on a plan for some students without having a plan for all students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Soto. Our next speaker is Avery Solnier de Reyes, followed by Roxy Harvey, Rosalba Chino, Elsa Wehi, and Danielle Emmond. If you can please raise your hands virtually. Avery. Hello, my name is Avery Solnier de Reyes. I am the parent of a Mission Hill sixth grader and two former Mission Hill students. I live in Roxbury. I would like to speak about my youngest daughter tonight. She was in the same class at Mission Hill as the boy whose mother spoke heartbreakingly about his recent experience at the school last week. They were friends. Neither of them attend Boston Public Schools anymore. Most parents and teachers I have ever met would prefer that any behavior problems at school be addressed when they're small addressed directly with families and students in order to solve them at their root. I heard the parent last week say she wanted to solve the problem at its core. She wanted to go into the school and observe and support her son in transition, but your people won't allow it. She wanted to have her son see a counselor at school. Your referral system doesn't allow it. She wanted her son to know that he could learn to stay at school as he was able to do before the pandemic. And the retired principal that you put there wanted to call the best team and chastise him in front of his mother. Penalizing children in this way often leads to involvement by social services or legal issues that can last years and have traumatic, traumatic effects on the families that they blame for the behavior that could have ad been addressed early on at school. Like other things, the effect of your code of conduct is worse for families of color. Teachers who are confident in their administrations and their freedom to choose various ways to solve problems can help children learn how to navigate difficult situations with each other. At Mission Hill, you took away a trusted administration by your own assessment, an excellent one. And you took away the freedom to teach social emotional skills. I don't want my daughter to learn that adults punish bad kids and that bad kids are usually black boys. And the other parent doesn't want her autistic child traumatized by adherence to a penalty system instead of a school cooperating with her in a social emotional learning opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roxy Harvey. Good evening, my name is Roxy Harvey and I'm a Dorchester resident, chair of SPEDPAC and a BPS special education parent. I wanna highlight the need for change, especially after this historic vote with um, elected mayor elect Michelle Wu. Constituents of Boston have indicated many times that education is a top priority that needs to be addressed. We need BPS to dig deep and push for their own historic change for our special education students, multilingual learners, Latinx and black students. 
It takes intentional systemic change and a vision to reconstruct a broken system like special education that has not worked year after year for our special education students. Accountability needs to be more than a word. It should be de demonstrated by your actions and measurable outcomes. The poor planning for school closures are deeply impacting and disrupting our special education students. All of our students need access to high quality school options instead of programs and communities that are being broken up and students dispersed throughout the district at various schools that are frequently poor performing schools. Families are reaching out to SPEDPAC saying they don't know what to do. They shouldn't be lost because the system isn't working for them. They need help. It is now November and many of our families and teachers are still calling about a lack of special education services being implemented. Our students are suffering from the impact of COVID and then they are returning to limited or lack of support in school. These circumstances are triggering and frequently impacting school refusal at home. At this point, it should be all hands on deck in every single school. It is not enough to say there is a staffing shortage. We can't cut any more corners for our students. COVID compensatory services meetings need to be completed and the information has to get to our families. Our students need plans where inclusion serves the needs of each individual student. Inclusionary opportunities should be uniquely tailored to meet the needs of every neurodiverse student within BPS. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosalba Shino. Good evening and thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Rosal Baschino and I'm the mother of two children in the BPS school system at the Elliott and Boston Latin schools. I'm a resident of downtown and I'm an immigrant and educator who has always valued the way the education discourse has been central to the culture of Boston. I second the efforts of this committee to make the BPS system more equitable, equitable, and I think it is everybody's goal to raise all children of Boston with the same education opportunities. To that end, I kindly ask you to address the question that raised during the school committee meeting of October 12 regarding the impact and equity of the admission process for the exam schools, and to use the current admission criteria for the school year 2022-2023 until there is transparency and clarity around the use of the 10 bonus points. Using the current admission criteria for the year 2022 and 2023 would allow the use of a current school year to perfect the design of a more effective data-driven admission process, which includes an entry exam that is embedded in the institutional nature, nature of the exam school. The 10 bonus points drive the automatic exclusion for exam, from exam schools of children residing in certain areas of the city, regardless of merit. How is this outcome factored in the equity equation of the admission policy? We are in November and it does not seem very clear how the new, the new grading system will be implemented and whether BPS has enough resources to support the new admission policy altogether. Will you share with us your plans in this regard? Similar to last year, we are not going to have an exam as part of the admission policy. Exams provide an appropriate measure, which ensures a fair chance to all students who excel on merit, regardless of their socioeconomic status. Therefore, why should we use an entering policy that allots 10 extra points to children with poor socioeconomics and does not counterbalance with any measure for children who can only rely on their merit? Given the temporary imbalance of such interest in policy, why can we use the admission criteria of last year and allow 20% of the seats in the exam schools to be allocated to high performing children of all Boston schools? Thank you for the opportunity of speaking tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elsa Weehy, followed by Danielle Emmond. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me and see me? Yes, we can. 
Hi, um, my name is Elsa Vie and I live in East Boston and I'm a parent of two children at the Allegheny Elementary School. I'm a former member of DLAC, the Parent Advocacy Group for Multilingual Learners. I want to start by thanking all of you for all the work that you do for our students. Um, I'm here to raise basically two main questions regarding school quality across BPS high schools. Uh, and especially like the previous speaker in light of the new exam school admission policy. Um, like many schools across the district, the Allegheny Montessori School in East Boston is one of those schools whose entire population of students is excluded from receiving the 10 additional points in the composite score because our school barely doesn't meet the 40% threshold of lower, low income. So the Allegheny School has currently 38% of low income, and this number fluctuates year after year. So frankly, I'm dismayed and I'm also outraged for the socioeconomically disadvantaged students and families at my school that who are all of them are automatically shut out of those points just because they chose their local school in East Boston, which is a high immigrant, low income and multilingual community. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, I, I think the former exam school entrance process always worked in favor of white affluent families, and that was a clear instance of systemic racism, and I really commend the committee for all of its efforts in trying to disrupt that. But, but this new school policy really automatically shuts out many low-income families on the basis of their belonging to a school, and many of those families are families of color. So number one, I'm here um, to say that this policy must be changed to move away from the school-based economic, socioeconomic status and instead to ask that the socioeconomic status be counted at the family, individual family level um, and, and to ask that on the basis of uh, income documentation with very special provisions for undocumented families uh, in order to protect them. And the number two, um, as a parent who I'm now looking at high school options for my children, um, I would like to really demand firm answers from the school committee about why Boston is home to some of the most underperforming high schools in the state. Um, why is it that the district is and, and all of our culture is forcing parents in a kind of bottleneck rat race to get into the exam schools, as opposed to investing in what it takes to make all of our high schools good schools, where teenagers feel like they belong to a nurturing school community, and that at the same time that they're challenged. Um, me, Elsa, if you could please wrap up. Okay, uh, we know what makes a good school. So thank you for your time. I just want to reiterate that the new school exam policy must be modified to provide point to families, not schools, and that we must turn our energy to the other high schools to make them high quality schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final speaker this evening is Danielle Emmond. Hello, everybody. Thank you for um, allowing me to have a few a few moments on the soapbox here. It's past my bedtime, so I'm not super articulate at this point in, in the evening. But um, thank you all for being here. And I'm basically just um, piggybacking what was said earlier about the Allegheny. Um, I, like the form, the parents before me, support the endeavors for more equitable exam schools and all the work you've done to achieve that. Um, but as a parent at the Allegheny, very tiny neighborhood school with a Montessori curriculum that's different than a lot of other schools, we struggle with retention anyway. And now with the new um, point system, it makes it, it will make it a lot harder. Um, there's also every other school in East Boston is um, eligible for these points except for our school. And we have a very small, historically a very small graduating class, maybe four to six kids. So it's basically taking these four to six kids in a school that is, is right at the cusp and telling them that they 
aren't eligible. So it, I know these were unintended consequences. I know that was not a part of the system. So I urge possibly a pause or an exception for our school for this coming school year. Um, and like Elsa said, encourage the, um, the evaluation to be at the, the economic tier level, individual level, so that we're not wiping out entire schools. Um, and also it would be great to have access to the data that, um, that, um, that these decisions are based on. I understand that they haven't been published yet. It'd be great to see those. Um, yeah, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Robinson, that concludes our speakers for general public comment. Great. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And thank you to those of you who spoke this evening and shared your perspective. Your testimony is very important to us. Our first action item this evening is grants for approval totaling $3,083,230. Due to a reporting error, the grants total originally listed on the agenda was incorrect. The total figure has been revised and the agenda was reposted with the city clerk this afternoon. The individual grants remain the same. The correct total of the grants for approval is $3,083,230. I will now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the grants as presented. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Rujo? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The grants are approved unanimously. Thank you. Our next section item this evening is a request to grant the superintendent temporary flexibility of the advanced work class policy the school year 2021-2022. You will recall that the superintendent presented this request to the committee during her superintendent's report at our October 6th meeting. The request is a continuation of the process we followed last year when the committee granted this policy flexibility to the superintendent for the 2020-2021 school year. I will now invite the superintendent to give final remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. The um, AWC um, decision was made last year due to being in remote learning, not to give the exam. We are in a similar position this year with still having the effects of the pandemic. We decided that we would continue to address um, the AWC at the school level where it has seemingly worked well for the schools who have AWC. As you know, this was a program that went from, I think it was 22 schools that offered it to four schools. Um, and next year we um, will have most likely just one school that has um, the AWC program within it because the Quincy School is doing PYP and AWC hybrid, as well as the Murphy School doing a hybrid uh, model at the school, offering a grade four to six solution for all students. And then of course, you know, the Jackson Man is uh, up for vote to close. So I think that um, at the Orenberger, they have been managing this. Um, there was a, a wonderful working group that um, was working. And I wanna thank the chairs uh, for that, John Travis and also Edith Bazil for their work on the working group. They are going to convene with our academic team around what we do at grades four through six for rigor and rigorous uh, courses and opportunities for students. Uh, also looking at EFA, Excellence for All program, uh, and trying to understand uh, its implementation uh, as we put together the academic vision, which you will be hearing from uh, Dr. Eccleson in just a few minutes. I appreciate the support. Thank you, Superintendent. 
I'll now open it up to the committee for any final questions and comments. Mr. O'Neill. Oops. Okay, sorry. Mr. De Arujo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Superintendent. I, I think you, you highlighted a piece that uh, I think is critical for me that uh, we have this emphasis on making sure that we provide um, rigorous curriculum across, you know, across our schools. Uh, and I, I worry that uh, the flexibility piece, we're just kind of rolling it, we're rolling it forward. Uh, I think they're, they're, the curriculums are out there. I think we can do this. Um, so that, that was a concern that I expressed at a, a prior meeting as well, that how does this fit into that, that bigger picture? Um, I am glad you're, you know, you're addressing it there, but, but my, my, my main concern I think remains that uh, I'm worried about continue, continuing to roll it forward. So those families that do wanna um, uh, choose uh, a more rigorous curriculum for their kids, they should have access to that at whatever uh, you know, elementary program uh, uh, they're attending in our school system. Yeah, I, I agree. And I look forward to uh, Dr. Eccleston's continued work at this grade level and the in intermediate grade level to find solutions to add more rigor. It is actually part of our exam school policy uh, as well to address the grades four through six preparation. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No. If there are no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's request for temporary flexibility of the advanced work class policy for school year 2021-2022 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Rujo? No. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Motion is approved with six in favor and one against. Thank you. Our final action item is the superintendent's performance goals school year 2021-2022. Among the chief responsibilities of the school committee is providing the superintendent with an annual performance evaluation. Part of that evaluation process is the setting of annual performance goals. You will recall that at our October 6th meeting, the superintendent and Dr. Coleman presented for the committee's consideration three student learning goals and a professional practical practice goal. During the discussion that followed, Mr. O'Neill requested that an additional measure be added related to family perception of cultivating trust. I will now turn it over to Dr. Coleman for a brief update on the revised goals. Sorry about that. Um, so as you can tell from uh, the materials that were sent to you earlier, um, the, the question was, what are the particular ways in which we would assess more of the community engagement parents? And so the superintendent and her staff put together a couple, uh, a few uh, metrics using things that we're already collecting to assess that. So the big question is whether or not, and I'll turn to you, Mr. O'Neill in particular, whether that uh, satisfies your question about how to, how to measure and assess uh, acute community engagement. So that's our first question for the night. The second, if that's acceptable, then are we ready to proceed with uh, making these standards of evaluation? Uh, Dr. Coleman, I would say yes. I thank you for um, listening to the concerns. I think it does tie to the strategic plan as well by doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I was pleased to see the addition. Thank you for that. Great. So before uh, we move to a vote on um, we would uh, uh, on these as the superintendent's goals, I think we should spend time with our other people in the committee who have questions or concerns or or or, or, or feedback, particularly as we uh, start thinking about interim moments for assessment as the year progresses. Mr. Dr. Coleman, I'd like to give the superintendent an opportunity to make final comments and then to allow committee members 
to raise any questions. Great, sounds good. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Dr. Coleman for um, really just shepherding this process along so that we could stay on a really good timeline for it. Um, I appreciate the goals and I appreciate the suggestion by Mr. O'Neill to add in the family perceptions. It was a concern of everyone's. And I think we were just trying to have some, some brevity and rather than leave it out. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad it's in there. Obviously with the testimony today, we have work to do in this area and I'm eager to do this work of getting it right for our families. Uh, it pains me to hear our families here um, saying they weren't engaged with and that is such an important value of mine. So we have room to grow um, and we will, we will do that hard work of being transparent and getting out there and working with our families and our stakeholders in a very transparent um, and engaging way so that we don't get these uh, folks coming. Um, we have we did that with the three closed schools, and I personally engaged with the three closed schools, and we didn't hear um, many of them coming because we're providing a lot of support, and we did a lot of engagement uh, where I neglected, and I take full responsibility of uh, uh, is the K five six expansions, and I should have spent more time on that decision. Uh, the team is is uh, going after that now. Um, and so we'll continue to work on this and the exam schools and all of the other ways we have to communicate with our families and, and just grow from this feedback. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Does anyone have any additional questions or comments? While people are thinking oh, yeah. of it, they read, oh yeah, okay. Yes. Um, Ms. 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 Garcia. Yeah. Ms. Palenco Garcia. Gracias, señora presidenta. Este, um, yo quiero comentar con relación a, la, a las familias, a los Very comentarios. Much. Uh -huh. Madam President, I would like to talk regarding the families and the comments. Y quiero um, decir que es bien importante que incluyamos a la familia y que, pese, y que pensemos en que la familia estén siendo escuchada. So I would like to say that it is critical. It is very important to include the families and to hear all the families. Porque eh, de la única manera que ellos van a sentir que En estas reuniones lo tomamos en cuenta es si precisamente lo incluimos a ellos. Because precisely the only way that they would think or attest that they're being taken in consideration is if we do include the families. Sobre todo aquellas familias que eh, tienen eh, eh, una condición económica desfavorable. Particularly eh, those familias families. Familias de color, familias hispanohablantes, latinas that do not have a particularly beneficial social economic condition. We're talking about the Latinx families. We're talking about families of color and disadvantaged economically families. Por eso quiero valorar y decir aquí eh, eh, públicamente que valoro la llamada que me hicieron hoy de la oficina de la superintendente, el equipo que está trabajando con ella. I do have to say that I do appreciate very much the call that I received today from the superintendent's office and uh, from the team that is working with her directly. Específicamente sobre eh, la expansión del sexto grado de las, de las escuelas que en cuestión que hemos estado hablando. Specifically regarding the conversations that had taken place regarding the expansion of sixth grade in those schools. Y valoro mucho que hayan pensado en formar una comisión, una, un equipo que pueda eh, ir a las escuelas en persona para ver el espacio eh, que ellos entienden que es hábil para tener un sexto grado. I do appreciate that uh, very much the fact that teams have been assigned for the purpose of visiting the schools for the purpose of evaluating the spaces considering the probability of expansion. I do appreciate that very much. Y este equipo va a estar integrado por padres líderes de la escuela, maestros líderes de la escuela y también la comunidad que sea socio de la escuela. 
And this team will be led by parents that are leaders as well, that school leaders are in every person that is associated with the schools themselves. Esto abre la, 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 esto abre la puerta para que las familias sí co comprendan que es, se está pensando en ellos, que estamos pensando en ellos, que estamos pensando en incluirlo y que la toma de decisión va a ser consensuada con ellos y que ellos van a poder ver el espacio, si funciona o no, si es bueno, si no es bueno y que ellos sean parte de esta decisión. It is very critical. This uh, kind of opens the doors for them to understand that they're being included, that they are being included in this important decision making, that spaces are being evaluated for the purpose to consider this expansion. They will feel included. It's like a door opening for them. I quiero um, dejar esto en el pensamiento de todos de que antes de las reuniones comunitarias que se van a hacer con cada escuela es importante hacer esa visita comisionada para que cada una de las partes en Huerta puedan ir al espacio y ver si funciona o no funciona. It is very critical, in my opinion, that before having this community visits of already conversations, it is critical that this visits take place in order to evaluate if that possibility is viable or not, if that will work or not. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay. So one more, as we move forward, one of the things is, as, and particularly for our, our, our new members, um, previously the superintendent's evaluation had asked the, asked the superintendent to provide this welter of data that was just too big and, and cumbersome. And it was just like, a, it often came back as a re reiteration of reports already given. And so over the past two years, we've moved as we were moving to become an outcome uh, driven district to really, really center the superintendent's evaluation among the big lever issues that we're trying to move forward on as a way to be more clear, more accurate, and, and more useful, both in terms of letting the superintendent knows what our goals are and getting concrete information as to uh, as that progress. So this, this as a process variable is a big step forward for us. And I hope as we move forward, we'll be able to refine it, uh, complete it in a more timely manner. I appreciate the superintendent suggesting that we did this in a timely manner. It's better than last year, but we have be, we should be doing this much earlier in the year. So thank you for your time and attention to this. All right. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, for your leadership in this area. Um, if there are no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's performance goals for the school year 2021-2022 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Rujo? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Our first report this evening is an update on the indoor air quality sensors. At this time, I'd like to invite Catherine Walsh, BPS Sustainability and Environmental Service Manager, and Brian Ford, BPS Executive Director, Facilities Department, to please present their report. First, I'd like to invite the superintendent to provide opening comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am so excited about this um, presentation. Our environmental team is just on top of it. And I'm really excited. I remember a couple years ago when we first went into this pandemic, uh, we were doing these walkthrough of air quality um, uh, reports and testing. And Catherine came to me and said, you know, if we just get these data sensors, I'm like, get them. <laughs> And um, they've just been wonderful uh, to work with. I also, I know we introduced Brian Ford before, but he and his uh, quality of service 
to our principals and our school leaders is really transforming the culture in our facilities department. Uh, his, his responsiveness is bar none. And I just uh, am so appreciative of him and our entire environmental team um, for the work that you're gonna see today. So thanks to the both of them and kudos. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caselius. Share the screen. Catherine's also responsible for the $6 million grant for clean water in our schools and um, on top of the 10 million that for former Mayor Walsh gave us. So we're really excited about that $16 million project to get clean water in the schools and she's leading that effort as well. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, uh, Boston School Committee, Chair Robinson. Um, thank you, Dr. Caselius and BPS community for having us here tonight. Um, as Dr. Caselius mentioned, I'll be providing an update on our indoor air quality sensor initiative. I'll start with just a brief background on why we are doing this initiative and then give you an update on where we are in the implementation process of this really exciting, innovative, uh, first time initiative for Boston Public Schools. So it should go without saying, but it's very important to state that it's indoor air quality is extremely important to everyone at Boston Public Schools uh, because of the impacts that indoor air quality can have on the physical, emotional, and social wellness of our students and staff the impacts that can ha have on their health, as well as attendance rates and performance in our schools. So Boston Public Schools Facilities Management follows, excuse me, follows the US EPA's IAQ Tools for Schools program. And why I think it's important to mention that program is they recommend a layered risk reduction approach to dealing with and managing indoor air quality. Um, and what that means is that you need to have multiple strategies that you're implementing in tandem in order to address indoor air quality and improve indoor air quality in our schools. So as you, you can uh, find here on this slide, we have a number of strategies that we're implementing at all times every day in our schools to address indoor air quality. And this program goes well back, way beyond the pandemic, but it's become even more important um, in addressing being able to have healthy school environments during COVID-19. And so today's focus will be on how we're monitoring, tracking, and reporting on indoor air quality in our schools um, but it can't be done if we're not also doing strategies like our annual at school environmental audits, preventive maintenance on our buildings, uh, cleaning, thanks to our custodial staff and all our buildings, our integrated pest management system, um, and even things like anti-idling that we have with our buses and our tobacco-free policy in the district. They all help together to create healthier, improved indoor air quality environments in our schools. So this timeline was really important to share because it's an overview of different strategies that the department and district took during COVID-19 related to indoor air quality and ventilation. Um, that included preventative maintenance on our HVAC systems, replacing thousands of filters, upgrading to MERV 13 filters, uh, distributing fans and HEPA standalone purifiers for our classrooms. It included the air exchange testing that we did across all schools in our district, as well as indoor air quality testing that we conducted. It included our compliance with documents and recommendations from um, our health guiders from CDC to DESE to ASHRAE to the EPA. Um, what were they recommending we do as a district in our buildings, and then showing how BPS was in compliance with all of that guidance. Um, and as you can see, we early on made a recommendation, as Dr. Caselius mentioned, that one of the ways we could really improve indoor air quality in our schools 
was to install sensors um, to give us constant monitoring reporting on air quality, um, give us the data we need in order to make the right improvements at every school building, um, and to not have it only be a snapshot in time. Um, when you rely on only doing in-person air quality testing through a human going in with our tools, that's only a snapshot in time. Um, so these sensors can give us constant data. And right now we're actually collecting more than in excess of 31 million data points every day, thanks to these sensors, as opposed to what was happening before manually. Um, it's important to note that, and we're very, very grateful that a lot of the work that I just mentioned was funded through ESSER. And in this fiscal year alone, we've spent a little over $1.8 million on air quality and ventilation strategies. Um, we have an existing plan that we've already implemented even this past summer to make sure that we're uh, updating and replacing filters following the tech specs of the equipment um, to make sure that we're not leaving dirty filters in beyond their lifespan. Um, we're updating the MERV, fil MERV 13 filters as well as the air purifier filters. And we also have uh, box fans and air purifiers, additional ones available on request. And the way to request that has been shared with school leaders in working through their operational leaders. So specifically, why install these air quality sensors? Um, as I mentioned before, one, we need constant data to see trends in the school so that we can make improvements. Um, as you know, each school is very unique. It's different. It's not a one size fits all approach to maintenance with our HVAC systems, with our windows. So having data that's applicable to each school is really important for us to have the best strategies for improving air quality at that particular school. We also know that when buildings are occupied, we can use carbon dioxide monitoring as a way to test for adequate ventilation and air exchange rates. Um, we really want to also be transparent. We wanna be communicative and transparent about the status of air quality in our schools we wanna build trust with our staff, with students, with families. We also wanna share that information so that we can empower people to collaborate with us on improving air quality so that it's a community-wide effort that everyone feels they have a role in improving air quality in our schools. And it's not just felt like it's controlled or owned only by facilities management. So, as of um, how we've been installing the sensor initiative is through phases. Um, and so every sensor is recording carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, airborne particulates, temperature, and relative humidity. And so in phase one, we've focused on installing a sensor in every single identified classroom in the district. Um, and we recently finished phase one just on Friday. Um, and so phase two, we're going back into every school and we are installing sensors in both the nurse's office and the main office. And then we also have a special rooftop unit um, that we're installing on every rooftop. And the reason we're installing an outside unit is that outdoor levels actually are used as your baseline. So it's important to understand that even in, within Boston, we have different microclimates, we have different neighborhood pollution issues. It's important for us to have that outdoor baseline at every school so that we're not comparing um, incorrectly one school in one neighborhood's challenges to a school's uh, challenges in another neighborhood as they may be facing different air quality issues. Um, in terms of the implementation process, we did use the opportunity index as one of the factors for creating the schedule. So even though we knew every single school was going to get these sensors in the same places, we prioritized based on equity and started the initiative in East Boston 
because that we know that is one of our neighborhoods that faces the most challenges around air quality. One of the most exciting pieces of this uh, initiative is again, back to transparency, back to communications, is that we're developing a public dashboard that comes along with these sensors. So what you're seeing here on the screen is a snapshot, a screenshot of what the public dashboard will look like. So someone would be able to visit the URL. The first thing that would be on the screen would be the map of the whole district. Um, the donuts are representative of schools and where we have sensors. And as someone drills in even closer, more schools pop up. Um, the green is representative of uh, basically levels being typical or within the standards that, and I'll talk a little bit about the standards that we've set. And then yellow is indicative of elevated levels. That's what the different color schemes will represent. Um, when someone drills down onto a particular school, another box, um, this box that's here will pop up and that will be specific information to the school. Um, this is still, I just really wanna be clear. This is very new. We are very much in the implementation phase. Um, so we are still working through how this can be best communicated, be accessible and transparent to our community. And we definitely are continuing to work with um, our communications experts in making sure that we can make this information accessible to our community. Um, so again, back to why we're doing this work. Um, the goal is that as we're getting the data, we can use it to direct where we need to make improvements, where we need to respond, where we need to either um, adjust our HVAC systems or work with a school who may need to open another window in their classroom if it's closed in the moment. And we're seeing that carbon dioxide is escalating. Um, we have developed a whole plan with our standards so that we can transparently communicate what those standards are, what it means to be in regulation with the standards, what it means to be elevated, and then assigned roles and responsibilities for who and how and when we're going to be responding to issues. And so I'll just end by saying, um, again, we just wanna share best practices with our schools so that we can build trust and have folks in the schools actually feel empowered to be part of improving air quality because we want to protect and improve the health and wellness of our staff and students. And so classroom strategies in general that we've ensured and tested are universal are to always leave on um, the existing HVAC system if applicable in a classroom, to open one operable window at four inches and to keep one corridor facing door open and to turn on one air purifier. And we've found that that kind of classroom setup helps achieve some of the best air changes per hour. That was something we tested all last year with our air exchange testing. And we made sure to come up with a strategy that was easily universal and could be applied in all classrooms. That's it. Catherine, um, just one uh, point of clarification. It also can collect particles, right? So students who have asthma were able to see the particles in the air. Yes, it is um, measuring particulate matter. And as Dr. Castellius mentioned, um, we have about 19.8% of our students with asthma. So that's a really important reason for why we're doing this work. Thank you very much. I'll throw it back to you, um, Madam Chair. Excuse me, is there a second presentation? Or is this a complete presentation? Is Mr. Ford also presenting? 
I'm not here to present tonight. I'm just All right, here. Thank to you. All right. Just wanted to clarify. Sorry. Okay. I will now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. I'd like to remind my colleague, colleagues about our agreed upon norm that we each take five minutes. That's one to two questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes, Ms. LaPera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Walsh, for your work on this and other environmental pieces. It's actually really great to see that your commitment and passion for caring for environmental concerns hasn't changed since your time at BC. Um, so it's great to see you here. Uh, one of the pieces that you mentioned was around the transparency and sharing information, um, but it, I don't have a full sense of whether that's already been made public. And so want to understand a little bit more about where the information lives, um, specifically around like the individual classroom as well as school level. And at this point, who has access to the information and perhaps the vision for future access to information? So I'll, uh, I'll just jump in and answer this one for you, Ms. Lopera. Um, as of right now, and please just excuse the noise, my, uh, I don't have a sitter for my dogs tonight, so <laughs> I apologize. Um, so the information pretty much relies with um, a company that we're using called an SGS, and we have access to that information upon request um, for any existing data that's there. Um, while we have to continue to pull this data at a request, it shows up, as Catherine was saying, as uh, up to 31 million data points a day, which become very hard to digest in a grid-shaped um, Excel-based sheet. Uh, we are continuing to work with the dashboard that you saw that has the, uh, the green donuts on it and the different color charts, as well as uh, all the units on there. Um, for consumable data, and we're hoping to roll that out within the next couple of weeks. But as we are still in implementation phase, we're working out all the kinks of fallen sensors. Sorry again, um, of all the fallen sensors, and um, you know anything that it might have been blocked, where it might have been unplugged or covered with uh, a piece of wall, or a teacher might have um, you know been leaning a dry erase board against it. So as we get this information ready, just look forward in the next coming weeks. Uh, for this information, but if anybody here um, on the board or elsewhere is looking for this information, you can always make a request to our department for right now. Thank you for that, Mr. Ford. And so am I understanding correctly that the hope is that at some point when it's been more beta tested and designed, that say a caregiver could um, look into what the air quality is at their school or perhaps even their individual classroom, their child's individual classroom, or uh, in addition to that, like school leaders, would school leaders be able to kind of um, toggle with it and engage with the information once um, all kinks and an actual digestible dashboard is created? So it, not just the caregivers and the student and staff that are in the, in the building, but anybody that wanted to, as Catherine and Dr. Casilia said, transparency. And so anybody that wants it, no login information required, we would have access to these dashboards. This could be some information that you use when you're choosing a school for your child. Uh, you're able to see the exact quality of the room that was there in today, tomorrow, and any day in the future um, as you get there. Appreciate that. And then my, my other question is, um, since you all have been looking at this and given the importance of um, air quality with the COVID pandemic, I'm wondering if you're seeing any differences or significant differences in air quality uh, with temperature changes. Last year, we were not, um, our school buildings were not open uh, during the winter. Um, and so I know that some of the recommendations are ensuring that windows are open um, and um, that fans are going. So there are a lot of different things that definitely impact the classroom temperature indoors, as well as obviously the weather. So um, I would just want to understand what, if any differences you're seeing in air quality as the weather changes, and perhaps some more windows are being closed due to drops in temperature. Uh, Catherine, would you want to speak to this one? Just because uh, recent data I haven't familiarized myself with uh, since September, where the weather was still on that cusp of warm and cool. Um, do you have any information on that, Catherine? Sure. Um, and please correct me if I end up not answering your question. Um, we, one thing we've made sure to do 
um, because we've asked people in the buildings to have a, one window open at four inches is we've been offsetting that by raising temperatures. We've been doing that since last year um, in order to manage having the windows open during the pandemic. Um, we tested the four inches as opposed to something bigger like six, eight, 10, 12, because we wanted to be reasonable given that we are in Boston with the weather. Um, we did all of our air exchange testings in the winter. Um, so we're expecting air quality to stay pretty good and consistent. Um, we're seeing good results right now. And the most important thing about the data is that it can help us just focus in on where we can make improvements. Um, and I'm hopeful that by being transparent, we actually may surprise some people um, that their air quality is actually better than what they might expect, which would be wonderful to be able to help people feel safer in the buildings. That's the point I wanted to make too, um, is that I think with this data, people can see exactly the air quality in their classrooms. Um, I have visited many classrooms, particularly in the winter, and they'll have three windows open and it's freezing in there. And you say you really only need to have one, but there was a disbelief uh, that one was enough. But uh, if you open up one window in your home and you open up the door, you can just feel this rush and that's what happens with the air exchange and that's what they want us to get. And then the carbon dioxide measure is another proxy for measuring that air exchange. So I think this could build some confidence in the measures that we're taking with our public and with our educators and, mm -hmm. and students. Yeah, I appreciate that information, uh, Superintendent Casilius and Ms. Walsh. I will just add, um, speaking about building that confidence, I know that, for example, in my, depending on which, whether he's in an English classroom or a Spanish classroom, which week it is, but he talks about that one of his classes, he needs to really bundle up because in one classroom, the teacher will open all the windows and they're completely wide open and he's freezing. And in the other classroom, the teacher will perhaps open one or two windows and they're not fully open. And so um, I think getting that information to uh, school leaders, teachers, community members, caregivers is really important so that they can see whether there are differences in those strategies of freezing, <laughs> freezing out the class or not. Um, so just appreciate the, the work on this and I'm looking forward to the continuing of analysis on what this looks like and also just the information that could come of it, not just as we're thinking about um, COVID impacts, but long-term impacts, health impacts um, and, and community, right? Like that it's not just for school, but also what communities are more negatively impacted by air quality um, and our location of our school. So thank you for the work. Thank you. And I just want to mention one other thing. It's like taking a thermometer, you know, like when you're not feeling well, you don't get alarmed when you see a number not right. You go in, you investigate, you look for other symptoms, and then you correct and mitigate it. And so this is our ongoing um, quality control around our air quality. And so if the team notices something is rising up or the principal or chief custodian notices, they're able to go in and mitigate, you know, was there a sweater on the air purifier or did the teacher have all the windows closed and quickly remedy um, that um, situation. So we anticipate seeing numbers that will elevate, but then that alerts us to go and take care of the air quality in the room. And Otherwise, we wouldn't have a way of knowing. Thank you, Mr. De Arujo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And also, thank you for um, this presentation. I'm very excited about this. Um, so uh, appreciate all the great work. Um, remember when I was at Boston Latin School, being told by a teacher that we had dangerously high carbon dioxide readings in the, in the room. And I had no idea what that meant uh, at the time. Um, so it's great to hear that now we have these sophisticated uh, sensors and, and focus uh, on this. And um, I did wanna say, I appreciate uh, the, um, the push for transparency on the data. I think that's critical. And I, I'd like to recommend even a step further where 
Uh, so I'm from, from East Boston and uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurial kind of like tech savvy environmental student leaders that um, I'd love to see folks get the raw data uh, on a regular basis and then let them develop their own queries and analyses. And, um, and so even kind of a, a you know, step kind of before that, uh, that just kind of make that data you know, free and open uh, to anyone really that wants to, uh, wants to use it. Um, but just a, a recommendation on that, uh, if, if that could be uh, possible. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I just have a question. Um, love the idea of having the sensors. My question are two things. You know, are we helping teachers to understand what's going on and how their decisions are being impact, how the decisions they make impact the overall comfort of students as Ms. LaPera um, explained, but also are there any curricula that help our children to begin to learn and understand what all of this equipment is doing too? As I think as, as we continue to grow our science environmental curriculum, how can we utilize having these tools to actually connect that with what the children are learning? Um, good evening, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just jump right in on that. Um, as far as having the teachers know this information, we, are, we do send out a memo. Um, in regards to what Ms. Lopera said, we did send out a memo about exactly how to set up that air change and ventilation in your space with the uh, window settings door settings, air purifier settings as well. Um, in terms of general education, as soon as this is um, public facing, we'll make sure to send out a lot more to the schools, staff, and um, anybody in the community for, to know more information. When it comes to the students and their curriculum, I think it'd be very important for them to kind of digest this data on their own, as Mr. De Arujo had just said. Um, so we're always open to ideas. Thank you very much. Ms. Lau? Um, I would really like to push for kind of a guideline for teachers on like windows and how to like manage the settings on like windows and like fans and all that. Because kind of like how Ms. LaPera said about her kid, uh, I go to a school where some of the teachers put the windows all up and some of them have them all shut and the room feels like it's 70 degrees. So like having to like wear like a heavy coat to one classroom and then taking it all off in another, it's really frustrating sometimes. And then just like not being comfortable in the setting, like where we want to learn and like be socializing, especially after the COVID, like no matter what kids want to be at school right now to socialize. So like, I feel like the comfortability of our students should be prioritized, but also like safety as well. Uh, thank you, Ms. Luo. Um, I definitely want to make sure that I'll get this information back out to the schools again. We'll try to put it in a Friday flyer, as well as uh, send out another memo just so they know we can reiterate uh, thermal comfort, right? We want to make sure that all the school environments are inviting and welcoming, and you do get to do all these social things that you've missed out on in the past year and a half, two years. Great, thank you. Any last questions? Hearing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Our next agenda item is a presentation on the superintendent's academic vision. At this time, I'd like to invite Deputy Superintendent of Academics, Drew Eggleson, to please present this his report. First, I'd like to invite the superintendent to provide some opening comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am really excited to present um, Dr. Eccleson and his team here today that has been working on this academic uh, draft. As you know, we're trying to get the engagement right on this one. So we have been working uh, with teachers and school leaders and with stakeholders. We presented at the um, Community Equity Roundtable. Um, we've made a number of other presentations to groups that uh, Dr. Eccleson will share with you to come with this draft. It is still a working draft. Um, there will be uh, more engagement and we will use this 
time to engage further with the community and bring that back in January to the full committee at your request, Madam Chair, for a review uh, at a retreat. And so at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Eccleson uh, for what I think is a very promising draft um, and uh, still probably a few more tweaks we need to make based on feedback, but it's starting to get there. And then if you could introduce your team, Dr. Eccleson, that would be great. Yes, yeah, Superintendent. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Great, thank you. And I, I um, before I'll, I'll introduce my team in a moment, um, I want to thank them for being here. Um, as part of the presentation. But I just wanted to begin by just framing <clears throat> what I think is the sort of big story that will be embedded within the context of the presentation that you'll hear tonight on the academic vision. Um, there are several sort of key component, uh, components to this story. And um, I think it's important that we just sort of name them up front. To the point that the superintendent just made, I just wanna be clear that this is very intentionally a draft presentation um, and we're hoping that through the dialogue this evening that we can continue to get feedback, not only from this body, this, the school committee, but also from, as we'll share in this presentation, multiple other bodies across the city who will help inform and instruct the way that we're thinking about an academic vision in the Boston Public Schools. Uh, we've already received uh, important and instructive feedback, uh, for example, at the Community Equity Roundtable and from the EL task force who've helped inform our thinking already on some of these issues that we'll talk about today. And we'll continue to do that in the weeks and months to come and look forward to re-engaging the school committee in a formal presentation on both the academic vision and the implementation plan in January. The second point I wanna make in terms of the story that you'll hear today is that this is very intentionally about um, a vision. And we have received significant feedback, and I think that that feedback is right on uh, across multiple presentations on the academics team, that we need to focus as much, if not more, on infrastructure and implementation and execution. I agree with that feedback, and we'll continue to partner with the school committee and with various central office units and departments and school leaders and educators to think about what will be necessary from an implementation execution perspective to deliver on this vision as we finalize it. The third story point that I think is, is very important is that we're gonna share data tonight that's difficult to talk about. And I think that that data sends a very clear message that the instruction that's happening each and every day for our students needs to ramp up. And that is not on the backs of our educators alone to solve. We all have a collective responsibility from the central office to our school leaders, to support staff, to educators in the classroom, to really roll up our sleeves and, and do far more around delivering on a promise of excellence and equity in the classroom. And I think the data that we'll share this evening, I think will also, um, I hope, um, continue to um, call out the importance of urgent action to improve on instructional um, practices and, and to improve academic outcomes across the city. And then the final point I wanna make is that I hope that this begins to offer a framework um, for what ambitious teaching and learning ought to look like in every BPS classroom every single day. And we'll begin to define what those practices are in the context of this presentation. And to reiterate a point I just made, that at the end of the day, we all across the BPS have a role to play to ensure that this vision gets enacted across classrooms each and every day for all of our, our brilliant BPS students. So in our agenda this evening, in a moment, I'll introduce members of the academic department who will be here. They'll talk a little bit about their work and I'll be sharing, um, we'll be sharing the presentation together as a team. We'll introduce some of the challenges and opportunities that we see ahead of us, uh, both in terms of finalizing the vision 
uh, of an academic vision for the BPS, but also around the sort of implementation and execution work, which is where um, this game will be won. I also want to make sure that we share some of the levers for change that will be um, that we think we need to push in order to drive forward with improvement in teaching and learning and introduce the key themes of the academic vision, which are very clearly in draft form and are intended for feedback this evening. And to give an early sort of introduction to some of the infrastructure that will be required in order to enact this vision. And then we'll close with some reflections on what we've heard from the community about quality guarantees. Thanks. Dr. Eggleston? Yes. I have a request from a couple of members of the committee. Instead of you going through the whole report and then taking questions, could we do it like in half? So you'll do the first three bullets and then take questions on that before going on. I, I'll do this any way you all want. So that sounds great. If you could just um, help facilitate that so I, um, okay. so that the team knows, you just tell us when to stop and we'll stop and take comments, questions, uh, feedback, whatever works. All righty, thank you. Um, and then I just want to, um, to communicate that as we're going through this process and we're building out um, both this vision and the infrastructure and implementation plan, that the racial equity planning tool will be at the core of what we have done and will continue to do. We still have more work to do on this as we continue to build out our strategies for racial equity and in the months and weeks to come, develop the implementation plan. Uh, but we have continued to move through steps one and two of this tool. We are in the process of steps three and four, and we'll be moving forward in the future on steps five and six. I am going to um, turn it over to my colleagues who are going to talk a little bit about each of the departments within the academic division. I want to acknowledge uh, Superintendent Casilius's announcement that Akita um, Narang Kapar has been selected to serve as the next Assistant Superintendent of the Office of English Learners. Uh, she's not here this evening, uh, but Deputy Chief Academic Officer Farah Azaraj is here and has a background for those of you who know her both in instruction and in multilingual learners, the sort of education and instruction of multilingual learners. So she will begin by talking about the Office of English Learners and then pass it to one of her colleagues. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share the academic's vision as Dr. Eccleston uh, well uh, put and framed for us this evening, that the focus is on the vision as well as all of the areas under our departments for the Office of English Language Learners we have to maintain and build up our native language access if our core vision for the district and the office is towards the seal of biliteracy in order to also improve our outcomes for English learners and meet the state and federal requirements within compliance as well as DOJ reporting. We know that the quality of instruction is at the core and a center of student success. And so with that, it is increase the native language instruction, as well as ensuring that we implement the WIDA language standards and complex texts along with grade level common core standards. So really ensuring that we are supporting the office and the district and teachers and improving outcomes for English learners with strong academics and strong instruction at the core. And that will lead us towards the seal of biliteracy for our students who are bilingual, multilingual. And as we continue to frame this conversation, we will move towards the language of using multilingual learners. We have much work to do with our students with disabilities who are also English language learners. So I'll we'll pass it off to my colleague, Ethan Devilmont Burns, who is the Assistant Superintendent for the Office of Special Education. To see you, am I here? Here we go. Uh, nice to see you all this evening. Um, again, my name is Ethan Dalmont Burns, Assistant Superintendent for Special Education. Thank you, Farah. Um, inclusion is going to be key for all our students with disabilities. It doesn't just benefit our students with disabilities, but all our students, and that's gonna be at the center of our work uh, in the Office of Special Education. 
Also, we need to make sure that equitable literacy is at the center of our work in the Office of Special Education as well, as it will be for all our students moving forward. Um, we need to make sure that our students uh, with disabilities are achieving at high levels. We also want to make sure that our students are in an appropriate setting and that they are getting their individual, individualized needs met as flexibly as possible. Uh, we want to make sure that we're basing this on the individual needs of our students with disabilities. To do this, we know that we need to make sure our teachers have all the tools they need and the expertise they need, and that they have done the learning needed to make sure that that happens. Um, and lastly, we're really, we need to focus on one of our lowest performing subgroups, which is our L's with disabilities, um, which is really critical that they take advantage of all the things uh, I just talked about so that they can achieve at high levels as well. Um, and really look forward to diving deeply into this work and developing this vision with this team. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Christine Landry um, from Academics and Professional Learning. Thank you so much, Ethan. Good evening to everyone. My name is Christine Landry, Assistant Superintendent of Academics and Professional Learning. And Academics and Professional Learning, or APL, um, our mission is to ensure that all educators have access to the knowledge, the skills, and the resources that they need to provide every BPS student with a high quality, culturally and linguistically sustaining and well-rounded education. And some of our areas of focus this year, um, which you'll note um, overlap with, with many of those that my colleagues have shared and efforts to break down the silos between our departments that have existed in the past um, include expansion of access and, and the celebration of native language fluency uh, through the seal of literacy in collaboration with OEL. Um, our guidance and coordination of the district's instructional focus on equitable literacy, which we'll talk about later on in the presentation at greater length. Also expansion of our early childhood seats in both BPS and in partner sites, um, including consistent resources and coaching for teachers in both types of sites. Also course development, professional learning and coaching um, to advance our ethnic studies and STEM instruction across the district, as well as proliferation of the best practices from excellence for all across the district, especially as part of our K-6 programming. And sort of encompassing all of those pieces is this enactment of the Mass Core policy, um, which uh, was adopted last spring and will go into effect in this coming fall. Um, I'll now pass it on to Jill Carter um, from the Office of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Christine. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jill Carter. I'm the Senior Executive Director for the Office of Health and Wellness. Our office um, supports the district's uh, mission to promote the social, emotional, and physical well being of students. Uh, we lead the district's effort to implement a whole school, whole community, whole child approach by coordinating and evaluating the wellness policy implementation and through wellness promotion efforts. We collaborate across academic student supports, equity and operations divisions to build the capacity of schools to create learning environments that promote student well-being, belonging and empowerment. Uh, we also lead the district's effort on whole child instruction in tier one, social emotional learning, physical education and physical activity and health education. As we emerge from the global pandemic, it's more obvious than ever that health matters. That means health literacy, physical literacy and emotional literacy matter. And most importantly, a commitment to collective care matters. We want students to have the skills and the opportunity to be well. Uh, we are working to ensure that all of our students have the knowledge, the skills, and the self-efficacy needed for lifelong well-being. Uh, if we create healthier and more welcoming and affirming schools through equitable ac access to high quality health ed, phys ed, cell instruction, as well as access to student supports and the policy systems and environmental change we're all working towards, then we will reduce those health inequities that improve student learning and well-being. 
Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Shakira Ford Walker from Teacher Leadership. Thank you, Jill. Good evening, everyone. So excited to be here this evening. My name is Shakira Ford Walker representing the Office of Teacher Leadership or OTL as we are fondly known. Our office uh, supports the development of teachers as leaders. We enable them to exercise that leadership to support student learning and well-being and drive school improvement. Our office also ensures that teacher voice is present and elevated at all levels of the system to inform the development and enactment of district policies and programs. As you can see on the slide, this work includes disseminating promising instructional practices through educator-led PD via our telescope network, creating and disseminating school-based innovations uh, through our teacher leadership fund, support for our early career educators, and the design of equitable teacher instructional leadership pathways that we hope will be accessible and coherent opportunities that empower all of our BPS educators to lead their colleagues both within their schools and across the district to promote student achievement and well being, just to name a few. If you know me and you know my team, you know that we believe teacher leadership must be a key component of BPS's strategy for attracting, supporting, and retaining educators, particularly our educators of color. We also believe it must be a driver of many other strategies across the system, especially those aimed at improving our schools. I am now going to turn the baton back over to Farah, who's going to ground this work uh, a bit in the data. Thank you, Shakira and everyone uh, for outlining the focus areas to your departments in particular. Our goal is to make sure that we are moving away from the silos. And so you will see this recurrence of our collaboration and cross departmental focus areas that needs to happen in order to make the improvements. Now tonight's vision that Dr. Eccleson will clearly outline and has shared uh, is outlined also in connection to our BPS strategic vision. And it is centered in our opportunity in, uh, Office of Opportunity and Achievement Gap in the policies. So in BPS and at BPS, every child in every classroom is entitled to an equitable, world-class, high-quality education. That is our commitment as a district that is part of our mission and vision. And each child should have the same unfettered access to every conceivable resource to unlock the greatness within them. So as we move forward with this vision, it's really important that we center this data as well as the vision and what we'll see that might really sort of shake us to the core. And for some, hopefully that is the, the, the emotion that might sort of reside. And as we see some of the outcomes, because we have to shift the narrative, we have to shift the outcomes and we have to move with the vision, with urgency in the implementation of our next moves. So we'll go into the next slide. And for the comparative years, we have 2019 and, excuse me, 2019 and 2021. We know that the past year in the middle of COVID, that students either returned to school for the first time after months of um, learning remotely and participated very soon thereafter with MCAS. And or students who, um, we also had another body of students who took the MCAS remotely for the very first time. In addition to that change uh, within this um, construct of the pandemic, the sessions in the MCAS were limited to one session as opposed to two sessions. Now, this data reflected here and the comparisons might not be true in terms of year to year. It is not the same assessment. However, if we go back to the history of 20 years in the BPS, we will see this trajectory unfortunately play out again and again um, and when we look at this data. So our work ahead is to also ensure that within the ELA MCAS average scale scores that we are moving students towards meeting and exceeding expectations, that we are providing the tier one instruction and the core instructional supports for students to be able to increase their performance and outcomes. When we move into the next slide, 
This is our map data, and you will see similar and even more glaring results as the map outcomes are um, even lower in comparison to the ELA. And we should make note that this was not a, a our district's performance in comparison to other districts or the state is not unique. And some will argue, obviously, in terms of the pandemic and the performance, as well as remote learning, um, that it is unique to this year. However, we really want to take a snapshot of this time period in this fall to look at the map data, which we'll show in the next two slides, so that we have a grounding of where students are at the beginning of the year based on our formative assessment and data. So while MCAS is a one indicator and those measures from last year may not be a true comparison to previous years, the story and the data that you see is unfortunately not new to, to many of you. So in this next slide, we will show you that the map growing uh, growth reading achievement data, which students in grades three to 11 partook in, uh, this is a newer formative assessment the district adopted. In addition to adopting, it has become a requirement for schools across the district to participate and for students to participate in both the MAP reading as well as MAP math achievement um, testing. This particular test that students took is an adaptive test. So what that means is that a student starts the test it either gets to sort of become a little easier depending on the answers because the questions might have been too difficult. And so it adapts to their level of responses. So what we see here is a quintile distribution. And then this distribution across our student population, so students without disabilities, students with disabilities, as, as well as English learners who are also students with disabilities. Um, and again, when you see this data, uh, I, I really also want us to sort of, uh, you know, feel what we feel and, and make sure that we sort of have that resonate with us, because it is that level of response that we need and the emotion that is going to move us with the urgency to make the changes that we need to see in our classrooms and instruction, as well as across the district and is supporting our educators to get there. When we move into this next slide. This is our math achievement data. Again, this is the distribution and those high average to high um, scores that you see there in the green, those are predictive scores and those are normed across all students in this grade level across the nation who took this test. So that is true for both math and reading. And that is the predictive score and um, percentiles that we see are, are predictors for MCAS as well as other achievement outcomes. So you might pay attention to the, M the MCAS math data here in comparison to the MAP growth achievement data. And you'll see that the correlation there is uh, somewhat an indicator of where we need to make shifts, growth, as well as uh, identifying that this is a beginning of year assessment. And so the hope is that we are moving towards the green, that we are seeing more of a high average and high, and that there is an increase in performance when the students take the test again in January and February, so that we have some comparative and growth analysis for students, as well as for schools and their action planning. So as a district, we should be asking the questions of what do we need to do differently? What are our action steps? Those are the questions that we are working with our school leaders and educators to unpack the map data to be able to understand what are my immediate action steps that are going to change the narrative and to move us in the direction of increasing student performance. One of our key indicators that you'll hear tonight as well that is aligned to this vision is grade level standards, grade level access to content. The assessments, whether it's MCAS or a MAP, are both, especially with MCAS as an indicator, it is assessing our grade level standards and performance. And that has shifted as we sh shifted to common core standards and it has shifted over the, the years and we have some work to do ahead of us to ensure that our core instruction and our tier one instruction is at a quality 
of rigor. It meets the standards. It also incorporates all of the um, areas in which you'll hear about tonight. But again, this data really, um, I think, pushes on us to, to also confront the reality of students and what is our action at whether it's a school level, a classroom level, at the office, a central office level, we have to act with urgency and we must make some changes to shift this narrative for all of our students. We are going to move into the next slide in which my colleague Ethan uh, Dabelmond will sort of walk through what and or pause here before we move into the next slide to walk through what we need to shift uh, in order to uh, ensure that all of our students are um, meeting and exceeding expectations and performance. Let's turn it over to yes. the chair or to the superintendent if we want to just facilitate dialogue at this point or? Yes. I've seen um, Dr. Coleman has his hand raised. Let's start there. Great, thank you very much. Um, this is a very helpful presentation, very exciting, the, the growing level precision, the interaction between the different groups. I think the co growing coherence is, is wonderful to, to, to look at. So my question, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a data question. So you gave one slide that represented the difference between um, among groups between current performance and meeting expectations. So it was a very stunning, painful, but a very clear slide. Then the next slide, when you, rep you represent the, the map data, you, you, you give it in a different framework. And so from where we sit, I guess from where I would argue, from where we sit, it would be more useful for us, I think, to have that data, those, those two slides look the same. So instead of trying to figure out what are all the graphs mean, break it down by the, uh, the groups and show the percent in relationship to what expectations are. And so, because, uh, and, 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 you know, I know that uh, um, Dr. Granson is working on this as we work to having a clear definition of what is the gap. And it really is not the gap in comparison to different groups, it's the gap to our expectations. And so if you, I, I think would be helpful for us and the community to represent our data consistently in by group, how do we stand in relationship to what is our, what, what, what's our expected outcome, the, the necessary outcome and, and be consistent. So we all get used to looking at that, but it's very useful, but a bit, I love to see that last slide reoriented so that I could really see a uh, by group how they were up, um, how they were performing in relationship to our exp uh, what meeting expectations would look like on the map data as well as you had for the MCAS data. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Coleman. We'll certainly work with our colleagues in the Office of Data and Accountability to make that revision in the next iteration. Other members with questions at this point. If not, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Eggleston. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chair Robinson. And I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry, a little clunky. Now that we've been having in-person meetings, I'm not as good at with Zoom as I used to be. Um, And Farah is gonna turn it over to um, Ethan Doublemont Burns, who will just talk a little bit about the sort of key levers that we think are gonna help us change the narrative so that all students get what they need. Absolutely, thank you so much, uh, Drew, um, for the opportunity to talk on this. And uh, just think it's really critical. We see, we've seen difficult data over time what are the key changes we can actually do that we can execute on to uh, actually make a difference? Number one clearly is robust recovery strategies. We are hearing too many stories of the challenges our students are coming back with, uh, both social, emotionally, and academically. And we need to make sure that those robust recovery strategies are in place. We believe that inclusion in every classroom is gonna be a key lever as well. We have seen time over time and state and national research backs it up that both general education and students with disabilities do better um, in inclusionary settings. And we are gonna build that across the system. Um, 
as Farah discussed earlier, we know that students learn better when they have more access to native language instruction. And so we want to build on that as well. Um, Drew mentioned earlier, um, and I think it's a key word, is ambitious teaching and learning. Uh, we have to hold ourselves accountable um, to high expectations, and we have to have those same high expectations for our students across the board. Um, L's with disabilities, L's, students with disabilities, black, brown, all our students um, are capable of learning at high levels, and we need to show that. The equitable literacy across all disciplines is going to be critical. Um, it is one thing to learn literacy during ELA, but when you learn it across the day, um, it, it, it becomes geometric in the way that students are able to learn. And we're only going to be able to do all of these things um, if we really have quality guarantees for every classroom in school. There are too many gaps, too many discrepancies, too many differences um, in quality across schools and classrooms. And we need to be able to guarantee quality to our families and to our students across the city. Um, and with that, I think I turn it back over to Dr. Eccleston. I can actually take it from there, Ethan. All right, Thanks Christine. so much. Sorry, go. No, that's great. Um, so the first lever for change that we'll we'll dive into is our ongoing recovery work. So this summer, um, our goals were to provide a, a breadth of opportunities to our students um, for honing academic skills and for rebuilding social connections. And we did that um, through expanded summer learning, learning opportunities, as well as um, various ways of supporting our students with disabilities um, and students who are English learners through enrichment programs and partnerships. At the start of the school year, uh, we launched our district instructional focus to build cohesion around research-based practices to support our improvement efforts. We've also made 24-7 uh, tutoring available to all of our students and our families, and we're supporting schools in making individual ESSER decisions that align with our district goals, as well as individual student needs. So as well as tutoring opportunities for all students, um, the academics division is also providing compliance recovery to meet students' required minutes of individualized, individualized services um, in ways that are flexible um, to students, as Ethan uh, mentioned before. And then finally, we have launched the application process for Acceleration Academies in February and in April uh, that will focus on a narrow set of critical standards that students need as building blocks for the following year to support their understanding of grade level standards. And we'll prioritize 75% of those seats uh, for students with disabilities and or students who are multilingual learners. Go to the next slide. And looking ahead, um, those acceleration academies I just mentioned, um, along with other enrichment opportunities will be available during those breaks, as I mentioned. And we're also committed to realizing that goal of developing and implementing a summer learning plan for each of our students in the district in collaboration with families, with students, and with partners. And then for the next three years and likely beyond, um, the academics division will guide and coordinate our vision for equitable literacy across the district. So this vision focuses on their five components um, of literacy and biliteracy instruction that together provide all students with the skills needed to make meaning of complex text and also to use language as a resource for communication and for expression of oneself. Um, students will be empowered through this work to use their literacy skills in service of themselves and their community which will be bolstered by our recent commitment to library access across the district as well. Through this work, um, we also want to provide an, a model for what ambitious instruction can look like in all content areas, um, as well as a, a fully actualized multi-tier system of support uh, with high quality universal instruction, so that tier one instruction, 
and then the interventions in tier two and tier three that provide access to grade level content within an inclusive environment as much as possible. So all of our school leaders um, and over 1500 teachers at this point have begun um, their journey in, in understanding and learning um, the deep work around equitable literacy this year. And that work is being led by a cross-functional team of central office leaders, school leaders, and teacher leaders. And I'll turn it back to Dr. Eccleson, um, who will share more about our emerging vision for ambitious instruction. I just want to check with the chair to see if we want to stop um, for questions or comments at this point um, or keep yes. going. Yes, let's take a few questions if there are any. I also, um, while we do that, I just wanted to thank the committee. I know this is an unorthodox way of presenting, but it really is a team approach. And um, me up here as the single person leading the academics department is not an accurate display of how this work is going. So I appreciate you um, entertaining and engaging all of us in this conversation. Yeah. Dr. Coleman. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, this is way too exciting. I'm, 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 I'm wide awake, this is great work. Um, I wanna go back to slide number 11, because and, and you'll get, get my themes here, is that slide number 11, um, you kept mixing the levels of abstraction. So at one point I could really tell exactly what you, what you meant. And then there are others that was, you know, education speak, if, 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 I know you, you, so that you may know what you're saying, but for us in terms of saying, it, how do we know this is happening? So for example, when you say inclusion in every classroom, we know how to measure that, but how do you measure robust recovery strategies? So those are just different levels of abstraction, which I think is we're gonna really push for more coherence. Um, if we're gonna say, here are the levers, they should all be, I think, identified the same level of abstraction. So inclusion, increasing language, um, those, are all this, those are all very clear, we know what they mean. What does really ambitious teaching and learning look like? We, we don't know that. And I think we need to know that better. Now in slide number 14, I thought that was a good example of being very clear about what you were saying. So we could really look forward, have a real sense of what's gonna happen. So this is, these things, we, we, can, we can measure how daily work with complex tasks. We can look, we can get an assessment for internal knowledge. So as, as you can tell what I'm heading for towards the end when I read the report earlier, the issue of when you when when we're rolling this out with integrity or fidelity, whichever work we're, we're going to use, that level of being able to know what we're looking for is going to be essential for us to know where it's working and where it's not working, and how we can hold schools more accountable for the thing, the levers we want them to use. We need to be able to be able to say you're not doing enough work with complex tax text and that's showing up in your data. So keeping each thing at the right level of abstraction with clear measurable outcomes, I think will be very helpful for us in terms of understanding how you're progressing and feed into our goal to be more of a data-driven district. But this is very exciting, very clear, very exciting work. So thank you very much for the, this. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Coleman. I think we'll get a little bit in the, in the later slide, but we're still not there yet. And so we'll continue to, to press on this. Thank you. Ms. LaPera. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, you can actually go back to a slide 11 um, that lists out uh, some of the pieces. Um, apologies for my ignorance here. So the things that I don't know <laughs> what they mean. Um, so when we talk about inclusion in every classroom and when we talk about increase in access native language instruction, my understanding of this is this would require um, a reconfiguration of staffing models. Um, and so I'm trying to understand, one, is my assumption correct um, that we're thinking of different staffing models, increase in staffing? Um, and two, um, if that is correct, or even if it's not, um, how are we really um, supporting teachers? Um, I know we talked a little bit about the literacy supports and the training that's happening, but how are we thinking about supporting teachers um, in ensuring that there's culturally responsive instruction happening in every single classroom. So sorry, joint question there. 
Yeah, both fantastic questions. Um, and so I'll just um, comment that, yes, your assumption is absolutely correct that this will take a reconfiguration and a rethinking of the way that sort of staffing happens for both um, a commitment toward um, and delivery on a promise of inclusion, as well as native language instruction. It also, particularly for the latter, is going to change program models over time. And that's going to have to be done in collaboration with school communities, uh, with the Department of Justice, um, with um, other of our partners um, in order to draw this up. And there are multiple ways to do that, right? And so we're going to need to have, um, and this is why the engagement portion of this is going to be continue to be so important, not only on the vision part, but also on the implementation. Um, and we are committing to this committee and to the public that as part of this process in January of rolling out exactly once we're clear and have agreement on the vision with our community, what's the, the implementation execution plan that's gonna help us get there? What's the project management plan? What are the deliverables? What is the professional development going to look like? We'll introduce a framework that's sort of guiding our thinking about this at this moment in time later in the presentation but we know we're gonna have significant work to do around building out the infrastructure to your specific question and point. Uh, we look forward to engaging in that in, in the weeks and months to come. Got it. And then I guess my other question on that is um, one, exciting to hear um, that this is a, a vision. Um, it's an ambitious one, uh, which is not to say um, that we shouldn't do it, uh, but I'm wondering, have we already started to do an analysis on which of our schools are already in some um, phase of implementing some of this, even outside of this vision. I guess what I want to understand is, is where are we, um, where, before we even start with this vision, where are we as a, a district? Like what schools already have really good pieces of this? Where are the bright spots that we can be learning from, from school leaders and um, educators in the classroom? And then perhaps what are the, the schools that are being most challenged and would need um, additional resources to get that moving? I'm thinking of, it's an ambitious goal of direction we should be moving in. Um, but when we're thinking about implementation, what are realistic timelines to get folks from point A to point B? to point Z, right? And so have we done any analysis of where some school communities are um, in a spectrum? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, uh, again, a, a really important one. Um, we have done some of that work. And so we have reports. So for example, on the native language instruction, the Gaston Institute has done reports on where are their promising practices that are happening around the district um, around um, native language instruction. We know where there's sort of expertise and talent and teacher leadership um, that we'll need to leverage. We know where that is for inclusion. We know where that is around our implementation of equitable literacy. I've probably been at this point of about 40, 42, 43 schools um, since the start of school. And I'm in every, every classroom, every school I'm visiting, I'm looking for implementation and movement toward the key principles that Christine just talked about relative to equitable literacy, really trying to identify. I saw an amazing kindergarten classroom today at the Condon. Uh, where the, the implementation of and the, the, the academic vocabulary and the sort of pedagogy around equitable literacy is exactly what we want for every classroom. So like, how do we help sort of leverage those sort of really great sort of teacher leaders to help us in this? They're going to be really instrumental and we'll continue to use that information as we think about the implementation and execution plan. Thank you. Other members questions? I have a question. Um, again, I think one of our other colleagues said there's a lot of edgy speak in this. And so I guess I'm looking for similar a little bit to Dr. Rapera around um, how are we getting the buy-in from teachers, school leaders around each of these issues um, and guarantee that they agree and then on the other hand, I haven't heard anything at all about parents. How do we help parents to understand this? And is there another presentation 
that simplifies these concepts in ways that parents can quickly understand what the expectations are and also what is their role in helping to make this vision come forward. Yeah, we, we recognize as we've heard this feedback, we agree. Um, we are obviously steeped in this work and we know we have significant work to do to make this uh, in plain, clear language. Uh, I think in a slide or two, we'll try to operationalize this. Hopefully that will sort of respond to some of what you're saying, Chair Robinson, but I, but I understand that we have more work to do. I, I don't know, Christine, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about to the, the first part of the question that Chair Robinson just asked around um, how we've worked to build principal sort of buy-in to the work around equitable literacy. I think um, I think that there is significant buy-in and interest in this. And I think the way that Christine and, and others have framed that um, has been a, a real learning opportunity for us about how we could be much stronger. Yeah, thanks so much, Drew. And thank you for that, that question. Um, couldn't agree more and, and really appreciate the, the feedback and we'll appreciate the ongoing feedback around the language. Um, I, I think that, you know, this has been a, a very intentionally collaborative process uh, with our school leaders. Um, and to our teachers, to some extent, we need to do more with our teachers, um, but thankful to have Shakira and her, um, her immense wisdom and focus on our teacher leaders at all times um, in this process. And she has been key in helping us define what equitable literacy is um, and what it uh, looks like in our classroom. So um, from the beginning, the, uh, the team which is uh, that plans our professional learning for our principals has really been um, a sounding board and a, a space that has helped to map out the definition to create the image that you see on, on uh, slide 14 mm -hmm. um, that defines the components of equitable literacy. Um, and um, to Ms. LaPera's point too, to start thinking about where those bright spots exist um, from the outset. So even when we were rolling out this work in August with our school leaders, the school leaders were, were rolling it out alongside central office uh, leaders and staff. So it was not um, a done to, but um, in collaboration with our school leaders from the beginning and their professional learning this year um, for all of our school leaders is focused in on each of these components, a, a day long deep dive into each that again is, is built in collaboration with our school leaders and more of the teacher leaders too. We're really trying to focus on our instructional leadership teams this year as, um, as the, the key lever for this change. And you'll see them um, presenting alongside and, and um, even presenting to central office leaders in, in some cases, right? Because I think as a, as a learning year, we've had to be, um, humble and, and honest about the fact that we're all learning new ways um, uh, to, to teach reading and writing, right? Um, I, you know, I was a literacy specialist myself and a principal for a long time and I felt like I really knew this stuff. Um, but I, I was trained in a different way as well. You know, so I even feel like I'm, I'm relearning a lot of it and doing that in collaboration with our educators on the ground. Thank you. You can continue. Thanks. Sorry, it takes me a second to set up, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna take the next two or three slides. So we wanna introduce you, um, when we're talking about teaching ambitiously across the, the BPS, and this is an ambitious vision, um, and it is gonna take a significant investment in infrastructure to make happen including the quality guarantees that we'll talk about toward the end of the presentation. But we think um, that we need to center a really clear and specific idea that, that our educators and our central office leaders and our school leaders and our community need to believe that the BPS students are brilliant. That needs to be at the center of what we do, the way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we plan for our lessons, 
the way that we think about the materials that are in front of students, it has to come from this assumption that our students are brilliant. And in order to do that, we have to know ourselves as educators. You have to deeply know yourself. You have to be aware of your own bias and you have to deeply study and understand our students. That is the first step in the process of how we're thinking about what it means to teach ambitiously across the BPS. We have to make a, cons a consistent investment in, including, in ensuring that our students have access to inclusion across the city. It is good for outcomes, it is good for all students, and it is best practice. We have to invest in order to make that happen. To Ms. Lepore's point, we need to make sure that we have the professional learning that will need to be um, paired with this plan uh, around implementation. It is also true, the research is also very, um, very clear, that access to native language helps improve outcomes for our multilingual learners, for our multilingual learners with disabilities, and is also a win-win for students across the system because we can think about innovative teaching and learning um, models across the, BP, uh, across the BPS that highlight and prioritize native language instruction. We need to make sure that our environments are culturally affirming, that our schools and our classrooms are, are safe and healthy. A special thank you to our colleagues from operations from their earlier presentation and that there's exemplary instruction happening across the BPS. In the next slide, I'm gonna define what I hope is in a very operationalized way, what that means and what that looks like and what it should look like across every BPS classroom. And the core instruction needs to be matched with enriching learning opportunities, both in and out of classroom. That means access to things like athletics. It means access to things like clubs and STEM opportunities that our students may not always have opportunities for. That means libraries and schools. It means high quality field trips that extend um, and pr provide exped expeditions for our students that are tied and aligned to the core curriculum. In order to get here, right, to, to, to have all of these things be true across the BPS, we need to make sure that these sort of key levers are supported or undergirded by a robust recovery strategy that Christine talked about earlier that our practices are not only um, uh, culturally affirming and, and, um, and, and maintaining and supporting healthy learning environments for our students, but that they're also culturally and linguistically sustaining practices across the system. We're talking a lot about tier one instruction. That's the core instruction that happens for every student in every classroom across the BPS. But we also need to think about the multi-tier systems of support, including tier two and tier three supports that need to be in place for students um, in all academic areas. In, um, in our partnership with Shakira Ford Walker's division and the school's division, we need to make sure that there's innovative professional learning and coaching that's happening, an investment in coaching um, that is really about um, um, figuring out how to ensure that practices are improving relative to the things that we are, are hoping to see across every classroom. So I was gonna do two quick um, slides and then we'll spend some time sort of talking about this um, um, to get some feedback. And so when we're talking about the specific aspect of exemplary instruction across the BPS, there are things over the next two or three years that we want to be true in every classroom. That at the base, every classroom has at its core appropriate grade level work, that grade level standards are driving the work that's happening in every classroom that students have in front of them and are engaging in real time with complex text, grade level text in every class every day, that they're reading from that text, they're writing from that text, that they're discussing that text across all content areas. And a text could be a book, it could be a poem, it could be a graph in math class, it could be a report in science class, but the students are getting these opportunities across all content areas that they're com the completing challenging lessons and tasks in every class every day, that they have opportunities as part of their learning to engage in problem and project-based learning that allows the students to, to apply their own learning from content previously learned 
to real world or, or real local problems that students see that they want to, uh, to work on. That they're asked questions every day that deepen learning and include students in academic conversation. And that the practices around equitable literacy are happening across all disciplines. And that students frequently are, are having opportunities in just really quick ways to be assessed around how they're progressing that educators and school leaders and central office leaders are monitoring student learning in really authentic and clear ways and providing real-time feedback. I'll just share one more slide. I'm not gonna get into the details of this slide and I know that it probably needs to be revised, but I think the key underpinnings behind this slide are very important. This is borrowed from um, a researcher at the University of Washington, Meredith Honig, who's written a lot about what it means to develop a theory of action that's focused on the needs of students first and ensures that all actors across the school system have a role to play to improve outcomes. So in the protocol that she sort of develops, you start with this idea of what needs to improve in student learning. And if we believe, and our data is very clear here in this context, that something needs to improve in terms of student learning, of course, the teacher is gonna have some role in helping to improve instruction, his, her, or their practice, so that we get to better outcomes for students. But this cannot be on the shoulders of teachers alone. The school leader who leads a school must be responsible for developing, applying, and leveraging his, her, their um, instructional leadership skills to help teachers grow in those specific areas to get to better outcomes for students. And if we believe that teachers have a role in improving student outcomes, and the research on this is very clear, and that principals um, have a role to play in helping teachers improve their practice to get to better outcomes for students, we too must hold this idea that the central office has a role in helping principals improve their practice. If they have the knowledge and skills that they need to be the best support systems for their educators so that the educators can be the best support system for their students and get to improved outcomes. So that's the sort of framework that we're thinking about. And it's really, I think what this slide is trying to, and to communicate is that there are, there are real in infrastructure um, commitments that need to be made, particularly around high quality professional learning and coaching across the system at the central office level, to help principals, to help teachers, to get to, the, um, get to get to the outcomes that we know our brilliant BPS students are capable of achieving if the, the system and structure is designed um, to support them. So I'm gonna stop here, and I'm sure this is probably a good opportunity for some questions and feedback, and we'll engage in some dialogue. Mm -hmm. Questions? Ms. LaPera. Thank you, Chairwoman Robinson. Um, appreciate all of the information that's uh, being shared. Um, I think one of the pieces that I'm thinking about when we're talking about strengthening instruction um, and the practice of it, I'm wondering, um, I know that our schools use different curriculum and I'm not necessarily advocating for everybody to use the same curriculum but I'm wondering how we're thinking about um, supporting school leaders and teachers in um, ensuring that there is quality research-based, culturally affirming curriculum and instructional materials in every one of our classrooms. Yeah, before I answer that, I just want, wasn't sure if the superintendent maybe just wanted to make a comment around anything relative to the DESI MOU on this. Um, I'm happy to answer the question too, but I just wanted to give the superintendent a space to answer that if she wanted. That's okay, Drew, you can go ahead and answer. Great. Um, so, I mean, I think um, as part of our agreement with, with DESI as part of the MOU, one of the things we need to resolve is what is what is going to be the role of autonomy in, 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 in the BPS. And so that's going to be a conversation that we need to have as a community. 
Um, and there's a process we need to go through to get there. But as I understand um, uh, the sort of language in this agreement is that it's gonna be something built around this concept of earned autonomy. Um, and so we'll have to sort of continue to sort of have these conversations um, to get to what is going to be the sort of choices that schools might have relative to um, things like curriculum. And so that's the sort of conversation that I think will be happening in the months to come. And my colleague, um, Ava Mitchell, Chief of, of Accountability, is leading those discussions. Um, and, and what we found is, and I think that this is particularly true, and if you look at the rollout of equitable literacy and literacy more broadly, particularly in the K to five or K to eight space um, in some of our elementary schools is that when schools are, are afforded and provided high quality culturally relevant materials, they take them and use them. Um, and I think that that is true in our implementation of expeditionary learning and true in our implementation of, of excellence for all. And so those are, I think, some practices that we're looking to sort of leverage as we think about what this might need to look like in other content areas where maybe some of the materials don't match um, the standards and the, and the expectations that we might hold uh, for our students moving forward. And just thank you for that. Just as a follow up to that piece, um, did I understand correctly that those conversations have already begun with school leaders or is that like a next step as we're thinking about this? Um, those conversations have happened relative to equitable literacy in the beginning stages and have not happened in other content areas. Got it. Thank you for that. Mr. De Arugio. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to ask questions about um, the, the, the wedge that you had on, on the slide. I can't remember which number uh, slide here, but um, just basically how, um, how we get to know our students and, and where they are. And are we giving, are we giving our, our educators and heads of school the tools, the training to really understand all the, all the pieces that the kid comes to the school with, the cultural background, uh, the home life, um, so that, so that, you know, have, I think it's essential to have, especially with the population that we serve, which is such a complex, uh, population. That's the super majority of our, of the kids that we serve, um, having each educator, having those tools, um, uh, to understand how we get, uh, that'll be critical to, to getting the kid to the standard that we want to get them to. And, um, and I, from what I've experienced at schools, seeing um, some, some doing really well. I think part of it is it could be, um, you know, the, the empathy of the, of the educator and the teacher wanting to understand and then uh, longevity and seeing, you know, really being rooted in the, in the community that they're, that they're working in and knowing, you know, these kids are all coming from this village in Colombia and this is their background. This is, and I, I know all of them and I know their, you know, their cousins and this and that and um, have a real understanding. Um, but then I've seen some comments, you know, especially like a, a discussion about attendance and and schools that I thought had similar populations and, um, you know, one kind of wondering, well, why is our attendance so low? Uh, it's because of, you know, whatever factors and reasons. And then the other one, the other having a higher attendance and I think having similar similar populations. And it's, it's hard to kind of judge that, but it just struck me as, as you know, maybe not understanding the, the population in the same way. Like why, why is one, you know, one school or program or whatever doing better than another? And I, I think that knowledge is important. So could you help me understand what, how, how do you, how are you gonna train or how do you train teachers and, and, and heads of school to understand kids and the tools and, um, and what, goes, what goes into that? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't know that I've thought through all of those details in terms of what the implementation of this needs to look like. And I think that that will be feedback um, we need to take back to, to the team. But we know we've invested in some resources to help us there, right? Like we have family liaisons in schools. Now, I don't expect that family liaisons are doing all of this work, right? But they can help create conditions at schools for people to talk to each other and to learn from each other. So there needs to be, I think, both um, when we're talking about sort of knowing yourself and your students, the vast majority of what we're talking about is exactly what you've described, right? And what the professional learning needs to look like for educators, we're going to need to develop that in collaboration with, you know, the school committee and um, members of, of our team. 
Um, but we also need to understand who our students are academically and where they are. And that's why I think this investment in um, things like paste interims and this uh, growth data that Farah had a chance to sort of um, um, share earlier are going to be really in, in instrumental tools in us understanding what the starting point is for our students and where, where we need to go. And the superintendent um, continues to sort of lobby and push and we're going to implement on this is that as part of that process, right, we need to develop individualized plans for our students that are setting ambitious goals for their, um, for their development and their progress using the data tools that we have and helping develop um, individualized sort of action plans um, to help them get there. And those are things that can happen at common planning time meetings um, in collaboration between and among teachers at different grade levels or in different content areas. Yeah. Okay, I, I appreciate I'll, that. I'll turn um, it over to my colleagues too if they have any other thoughts on this, but um, it's an important question that we obviously have to do more thinking about. Yeah, and I'll just, oh, I don't know if anyone wanted to add to that, but I'll pause for a second. Um, but yeah, I just, just to, I appreciate that. And um, I just think it, it, it is really critical, um, you know, seeing, you know, seeing families that, that, you know, literally, you know, are, <laughs> arrive at South Station, right, in a bus from, Honduras or wherever, and uh, and not having uh, um, you know not having a background in a Western style education, even if they're in a rural area or have very limited you know literacy and education and so forth, and and that's that's a lot of our our customers, um, and I think it's uh, having that it's I think it's it's beyond like cultural competence, right? Uh, although that's a critical kind of mindset, um, but um, but yeah, giving giving those tools. Um, also, I can see this tied to and you've addressed this before the the diversity uh, and the student of course der diversity of the workforce um, um, and not just you know you know racial which is critical and we're under the um, uh, the, the mandates uh, but broadly and I'm, and I'm not saying that you know I have to be the same uh, gender or race or kind of background of a student to understand and so forth but but there's there's a lot to that right if someone comes from your community um, at least having a, a base foundation in that uh, doesn't mean you, you know, you're going to be, you'll be effective at using that knowledge, but, um, but yeah, all, all those things I think are tied together and, um, uh, and critical for us to getting it right for the students that are there today. Um, so thank you. Ms. Lau. Um, so I have some concerns about how this will all be introduced to the students because I know like maybe like some students wouldn't understand it because it is a lot of complicated language. Um, but is there a way to be like simplify all of this for um, the students since like I feel like a lot of the integration of these programs is great, but to have it all like suddenly like integrated like a lot of kids may not understand that process and a way to kind of like pay attention to that health, the mental health and like emotional wellness of them. Yeah, we, we would um, love an opportunity to the extent that you and your colleague um, would have some time to give us some feedback, particularly as we meet with some of the student groups, you'll see in a later slide, our intention to meet with some of the student leadership groups and other students across the system. And we would love feedback to help us be able to communicate this in a way that speaks to students in powerful and exciting ways that get them excited about opportunities um, I think you'll see in, in a moment, we're going to talk a little bit about quality assurances that need to be true or quality guarantees that need to be true across the VPS. And I think these things are very concrete and, and those are things that my students might find very exciting. And so maybe that might be a good starting point, but we'll certainly um, welcome your feedback and your colleagues' feedback, uh, Ms. Mercer's feedback to help us, um, to help us in, inform the way we talk to student groups about this. Thank you. I look forward to connecting on those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, as I listened to you sort of give the vision for all of this, it really struck me that um, you are almost re-educating educators as much as you are going to be educating students. And, you know, that, they're, that you're asking a lot. And I'm thinking of, you know, we're, we're asking a lot of teachers every day, school leaders every day, in terms of managing the issues of the pandemic, 
and the other realities of day-to-day -day school administration, and then an extraordinary amount of commitment to a wide variety of new or shifting professional development, attitudinal change, any number of things um, to move into being able to manage this process and get the outcomes that you're looking for for students. So how, you know, so how, what is the, the action steps that move this from a vision into action? Yeah, when, when we have our retreat, that's where I'm hoping we can sort of have the majority of our conversation that will okay. have gone through this sort of feedback loop with the community will have this refined. We don't have to spend as much time on sort of the vision portion of it okay. because we've responded to the feedback and we can we spend the vast majority of our time on the implementation and execution. I, I just wanna double, triple click a point you just made, which is that we have to acknowledge the, the realities of what's going on for our schools. You all are hearing about it. Our communities are hearing about, it. there are challenges, right? And those are things that we have to be honest about. And the data is, is is right in our face that we have to do significantly more. And the only way to do that, the only way to get to improved outcomes is to change instructional practice in classrooms that students get across a system. And there's a role for central office to play in that. There's a role for principals and there's a role for teacher leaders to play in that so that we can deliver on this promise for our brilliant students. And so we're gonna have to have that conversation around the sequencing of this, around the investments, around the supports, um, at this retreat. And it's going to be a long, hard conversation, um, but that's going to be the important part of the work. At the end of the day, this game will be won by our implementation and execution plan. Thank you. Dr. Coleman? I want to um, affirm your question, uh, Chair Robinson, because you know professional development of the teachers is is, is the linchpin. That's that's where the rubber meets the road, and so I know that Ms. Ford Walker is very focused on that. And so I'd, I'd not tonight, but in the retreat, it'd be very important because professional development is an area across our industry that no one really tracks. Well, I mean, it, it is one of the things that we all do, and we don't. Some it's it's mystical when it works. So. It would be helpful if we if we get a, a clear understanding of how professional development can be done differently in BPS to achieve this these consistent um, um, improvements in instruction, um, and how we're going to track that and know it's happening. It's, it'd be very important. Understanding it's not happen overnight, right? This is a five, yeah. 10 year plan, right? So it, we, I think as a community, we need to be really honest. This is not gonna be uh, magical by the end of this year. It's gonna be five, 10 years until the whole teacher core is, is involved in that, which is my pitch to the consistency of leadership that we need in the district to implement this and get there over time. Thank you. Really well said, yeah. yeah. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. See, I'm getting a little faster at this. Um, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Shakira Ford Walker, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, the quality guarantees um, across the BPS. Thank you, Dr. Eccleston. Boston Public School students are brilliant, period. Boston Public School students are also the citizens, the leaders, the scholars, the entrepreneurs, the advocates, and the innovators of tomorrow. As you've heard this evening, together we are committed to making BPS a place where all of our students can receive a world-class education. My grandmother, who's 83 years old, often uh, tells me that I'm speaking in EduSpeak and that came up a lot tonight. And she says to me at times, make it plain. And so on this slide, uh, we hope it reflects concretely what we've heard from students, families and educators about what should be true for every BPS student. Not some, not most, not a few, not many, but every student. This includes access to a rigorous curriculum and high quality instruction. We all know that what students learn in school is crucial to their future. Every student deserves a rich, well-rounded and rigorous curriculum in order to be prepared for a college or career of their choice. This includes native language instruction, a library with a licensed librarian, 
arts education, physical and health education, and learning materials for project-based and center-based learning. This also includes access, as Dr. Eccleson mentioned earlier, to enrichment activities that occur both within and outside of school. Activities that we believe are designed to expand the skills and experiences that children have and helping them pursue their own areas of interest and strength. This includes athletics uh, pre-K to 12, before and after school programs, opportunities for our youth to engage in civic leadership, as well as partnership and fundraising equity across our schools to ensure that all schools have what they need to meet the needs of our students. We know that preparing our students to succeed will also require buildings that support, support transformative teaching and learning. This means we'll need to upgrade our buildings so that there are 21st century facilities and furniture, cooling and heating systems that we heard on the previous presentation, air quality and monitoring, playgrounds and gardens, gymnasiums, all the things that will serve um, such that the environment becomes the second or the third teacher. And lastly, we've heard a little bit about student and family supports. What are those resources and supports needed to meet the diverse needs of our students and families in BPS? This includes social workers, family liaisons that were mentioned previously, nurses, uh, nutritious meals for all of our students, and I would even say our staff members, support for housing, as well as ensuring that um, our staff in our schools represent the racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity of all of our students. We also solicited feedback uh, by grade ban and our stakeholders elevated their voices about the elementary and secondary experiences our students should have access to. As you can see on the slide, this includes rigorous academic preparation, STEM education, dual language learning for our scholars, outdoor play spaces, as well as swimming lessons in the elementary years. And for our secondary scholars, this includes um, access to advanced coursework, AP, IB, early college and dual enrollment, as well as career and technical education experiences, access to Mass Corps, uh, electives that are peer reviewed and enriching opportunities and planning for college and or career. Our goal this evening and as we continue our collaboration moving forward is to get feedback from all of you as well as our various stakeholders on these quality assurances so that we can finalize a list of those BPS guarantees or quality guarantees and build out a plan um, such that we can make it happen. I am going to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Jill, who's going to talk a little bit about um, our next steps for engaging the various stakeholders who are going to collaborate with us in carrying out this plan. Thank you, Shakira. As you've already heard, the vision we presented tonight is a draft. For our next steps, we plan to gather feedback from you, uh, the school staff, central staff, family groups, and others and iterate on the draft to incorporate the stakeholder feedback. We will build an implementation plan and an execution plan and an infrastructure uh, uh, plan to support implementation. Uh, in December and January, we will work with the school committee to finalize the vision and the plan, the infrastructure and other plans. The superintendent will present this um, to Mayor-elect Wu and discuss needed investments and a funding plan. We will present on the revised vision, implementation, and multi-year financial plan to fund and sustain the core work. Next slide. In February, we will propose an academics division organization to provide real-time academic supports to schools. We will also uh, fully staff the academic division to ensure level, uh, level of support needed for school. And finally, publish a 2022-2023 professional learning modules for school leaders, instructional coaches, and educators. I'll turn it back over to Drew. Way too many things to click all, all at once, sorry. Um, so now at this point, we just wanted to continue to open it up for feedback and comments, um, particularly on the quality assurances um, or quality guarantees that Shakira presented or the next steps that Jill presented. 
Members, please raise your virtual hands if you have more comments. I just want to reiterate this is really exciting work and that's been it's, it's been a long time coming and and the breadth that you're taking on is remarkable and the coordination that you're demonstrating is remarkable and so I just want to say how encouraging that is uh, to, to hear and have it come together and the way you you, you shared it like a team uh, reflects I think um, the type of things that will happen that are going to be good for all our children. Mm -hmm. Ms. LaPere. Yes, thank you for that, um, Chairwoman Robinson. Uh, I just want to thank the team for putting this together. I think that it is indeed a, a bold vision, and I'm um, looking forward to, if I have the opportunity to engage with you all in the retreat, to really dig into what implementation could look like. Um, I think one of the other pieces that I'm grateful to see represented is uh, this holistic view um, with the new mayor thinking about facilities as well, um, because that is a key component of being able to drive some of these pieces that are mentioned in the vision. Um, mm -hmm. Can't really have a rigorous STEM education if you don't have a STEM lab, right? Or if you don't have programming around robotics, et cetera. So um, I think that that's, a, that's something that's really exciting for me to see. And I, I just, whether it's in this role or another role, I'm looking forward to rolling up my sleeves with you all to make this work happen. Thank you. Others? Yeah. I'm also very excited about all this and I, I can just see all of the hard work that's gone into the preparation and the thought, very lofty goals. My caveat is when we did build BPS, we didn't include everyone. And so some schools did, some schools were involved and had a plan and others did not. How do we make sure that for this, there is a plan for each and every school where they get to assess where are they now? Um, particularly looking at those last slides that had that all of those things that the quality assurances are. How, how do we actually acknowledge what is in place, what isn't in place, and what the priority becomes school by school or district so that those issues of equity begin to become better in alignment with one another? Yeah, I hadn't thought of that question. I think it's a really important one. So I'm like, I'm envisioning a, some sort of system and structure that would allow us to do that, right? In collaboration with the, um, um, uh, you know, the, the racial equity planning tool at the specific level, having round tables at specific schools, equity round tables at specific schools to actually analyze, all right, if these are the guarantees, let's have conversation now around which things are like, strongly being implemented already, which things are in progress, which things haven't started, right? And then developing action steps with, in partnership with each school superintendent and each school community to determine what the priorities are gonna be. So there's a, there's a path forward on that. Um, and I think we can talk about that more at the retreat, but that's gonna be a really critical thing for us to take stock of where we currently are relative to these guarantees and then develop um, an implementation plan to get there. I think it's a really important point. I um, just want to note, Madam Chair, that uh, Chief Cooter is working on this for our FY23 budget. And as we uh, build out our budget and our ask of the city around these quality guarantees, and um, as we also align to ESSER funding, and then any additional title funding, uh, federal funding that may be coming as part of the president's budget as we think ahead as well. Mm -hmm. And, and something I noticed that was missing from both the elementary and the high school asks was anything about arts education. And um, I know how important that is from many different aspects. So I'm hoping that we will continue to look at and grow the hard work that investors and others have been doing in the arts as we move forward um, as well. 
That is absolutely a big piece of the vision moving forward. Arts, athletics, uh, PE, health, yeah. uh, libraries. You know, these are the things that, um, you know, parents have been asking us for. And, and it, you know, I like also that we have things that parents ask for like before and after school care. Right. Uh, you know, transportation that works and is on time. I mean, so these are the things that will be part of our quality guarantee and, and budget will be looking at keeping track of that as well as um, our, hopefully our new risk management office. Thank you. Are there any final questions, comments? Just on behalf of the academics team, I want to thank you for this great feedback. We know that this is a, a work in progress. We're going to do our engagement work, continue to have conversations with the community. I think we'll come back to you with something that's that's more informed, stronger, um, definitely responding to your feedback about all the wonky uh, edge you speak um, and be better prepared um, to have a real thoughtful dialogue in collaboration with all of you on implementation and execution and investments that are going to be necessary to make that happen. We want to thank you also for all, for you, your team's hard work in this, and um, we look forward to moving forward on this soon. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to public comment on reports. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. We have no speakers for public comment on reports. Right. Thank you. Is there any new business? Mr. DeRugio. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, noted again uh, in public comment uh, earlier, uh, requesting the, the, the data simulation on the 10 points and, and no 10 points on the exam school policy and just hoping that, uh, I don't know if it's the next meeting, but that we get that in time uh, to evaluate um, before the, the final imp implementation for the, for the kids this year. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Coleman? You know, I, I, I say there's some hesitancy because I don't have a clear, um, I don't know how well I can articulate or a clear response, but um, I, I, I share a lot of the discomfort people have around the way the strategies associate with build BPS. And this is not cast, I think people work very hard at it. It's a difficult problem. I, I, I worry that we started this, we, we engaged in this problem at one time in one way and the world's changed and we may have to maybe pause and reconsider deeply our strategy uh, about going that because it's clear to me that there are a lot of unintended consequences that we, the people, from, they think it's intentional, but I think it's unattended. And so I know in my world, we talk about doing a master campus plan. And it's a, it's a 10 year plan and you go to every building and there are people who do that consciously for a living. And I don't think we've ever engaged in it that way. Build BPS has been some immediate problems and some ideas at different, between the mayor's office and our, and our you know, so I don't think we've ever sat down and said, we need a master campus plan. And we need someone who has the skills to develop that and create it and do all the deep dives and do all the interviews and come up with a proposal. You know, it's a mixture of professionals and people engaged. And so I, I, I don't have a good solution, um, but I'm, um, I, I worry that we have so much sunk cost in the current perspective that we're unable to back off. So I would, Maybe in a tree, I don't know mm. when, but I want to put on the table that I'm not convinced that the way we're doing build BPS is working for us or our constituents. Mm. And we may want to stop and reconsider the approach, the, the, the way we're doing it, knowing that the problems don't go away. So for example, yeah. we all, agree, I think many of us agree, we want to reduce transitions. And so going to sixth grade is, you know, K-6 makes sense and we have a lot of externals. But we didn't, I don't think we've systematically in the long term thought that through. And so we get these pinch points and we have these devastated families, um, which hurts us all. But it's not, and I know it's not intentional, it's an unintended, but, but I th I, maybe we have to rethink our strategies. Yeah, I appreciate that, Dr. Coleman. Um, as you know, 
when I came to um, Boston, this was one of the questions I was asked about committing to the Build PPS uh, pathways. And uh, we've been attempting to do that. We do um, currently have an RFP out where we are gonna ask for external help to do exactly what you said. So uh, I think I'll bring that back in my update at the next meeting to share with you a little bit more about that request for proposal and the process that we hope to go through with the public around uh, Build PPS. As you know, and I mentioned it in my last school committee meeting, I think we need a billion dollars for the next uh, 10 years in order to revamp our school buildings uh, from the people of Austin. We send our children to school buildings, 60% of them built before 1940, um, many of them without clean water. And um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done to get to this quality guarantee. And then I'm hoping that we'll have a, a bold vision as a city for our children in the future. Thank you, Superintendent. Ms. LaPera. Uh, thank you, Chair Robinson. Um, I can't leave the space without <laughs> double clicking on a couple pieces. Um, what member Derujo brought up regarding uh, the impacts on unintended impacts on some of our school or potential unintended impacts of some of our schools related to the new exam school policy. Um, so I encourage you all to continue to revisit that. Um, the other piece around the master plan. Yes, I actually last week walked away from the presentation thinking of really in, when I was in college, there was this whole rollout around the 10 year master plan. And so, um, you know, how can we, how can we take some of those best practices and some of that external support to really uh, rethink um, some of that work? And I think um, the last piece that I just wanna uh, introduce as new business, knowing that my future is unknown, um, is that uh, my, um, my predecessor um, member, former member, um, Alex Oliver Davila, um, I know joined this school committee many years ago um, because of youth voice and the importance around youth voice. Um, and I've had the opportunity to learn so much um, from Ms. Mercer and from Ms. Lau. And I just really encourage um, the committee to uh, rethink or really think about the role of the student representative on the committee um, and creative ways of um, truly amplifying and giving that voice the weight that it deserves. Um, so wanted to um, introduce that as new business um, as you all continue to think through the pieces that you will evaluate and discuss moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Pera. Any other new business? If not, thank you. That concludes our business for this evening. And the next remote school committee meeting will take place on Wednesday, November 17th at 5 p.m. If there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes, have a great week, everybody. Mr. De Rujo? Yes, thank you. Ms. Lopera? Yes, buenas noches. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes, buenas noches. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good night.